Hey, Dr. Patrick Jones here from the Homegrown Herbalist School of Botanical Medicine, and we're excited to have you tonight. We're doing a live webinar here, and it uh, looks like we've got lots of folks signing in uh, on the chat there. That's fantastic. I hope you enjoy the presentation. Any questions you have, put them up there, and uh, we'll get to them at the end. I'm not going to cover everything, you know, so if you want to know something that I didn't cover, poke it up there, and we'll talk about it afterwards, all right? So, uh, like I said, I'm Dr. Patrick Jones, and we are going to be talking about tonight um, when you're sick as a dog and you are a dog, uh, herbal medicine for pets. Um, and uh, as soon as we show the dog picture and say the word pets, everybody's going to ask, well, what about my chicken? Don't worry, we'll cover them too. All right, we'll be... <laughs> well, I could talk all weekend just about gastrointestinal stuff in dogs or wounds in dogs or whatever uh, and we don't want to have a 30-hour video if we start talking about chickens it'll be a week okay and so we will do different videos on more specific topics of course um, and we'll do something on goats and something on chickens and something on everybody uh, chihuahuas all those things that aren't really dogs uh, and uh, <laughs> but tonight we're gonna talk about dogs um, and cover a number of things we're uh, in our new studio tonight, in our new building, uh, we just moved a week ago, so everything's been chaos and bedlam here for for a week or so, but we're happy to be here. Uh, Evan is uh, my IT genius guy. He's doing all the everything that makes any of this possible. We're really grateful for him. Um, so like I said, I'm Patrick Jones. I am a veterinarian. I've been in practice for about 30 years. Um, I'm also a traditional naturopath, went to naturopath school. And a clinical herbalist, obviously, and founded the Homegrown Herbalist School of Botanical Medicine. So if you'd really like to learn some stuff about herbs and critters or herbs and little old ladies or herbs and anything, uh, I would really recommend you have a look at that. Um, our perspective is very different. Because I'm a veterinarian, I can treat anything I want with herbs, right? And so I've had uh, a lot of opportunities to use herbs in ways that most herbalists don't, and that is reflected in the curriculum of the school. Um, and we are uh, right now, most of the curriculum in the school is mostly focused on human stuff. Uh, but uh, I always have mentioned the animal things, you know, if we're talking about digestive stuff, we talk about horses with colic and dogs with parvo. Um, but I am just now starting some very specific animal modules uh, that go deeper into some of the more bizarre things about herbal medicine and animals. And so if, uh, if you're in the school, look forward to that. If you're not in the school, uh, sign up and then you can look forward to that, right? So <laughs> uh, just before we start anything about herbs, I just want to mention and remind you that herbs and drugs can interact. So if your dog's on medicine, uh, don't put him on herbs unless you know what you're doing and talk to somebody, okay? Uh, also, a lot of herbs aren't safe for pregnancy or lactation, and it doesn't matter if you got a baby in your belly or puppies, right? Uh, you got to be careful with that. Um, so look into that carefully before you use any formulas on, on your dogs, just like you would for a human. All right, so um, <clears throat> veterinary medicine with herbs, herbal veterinary medicine, is as old or older than human medicine with herbs. I mean, the oldest documents we have on herbal medicine, you know, old Chinese, you know, transcripts and old Ayurvedic stuff from India is about animals. You know, it's almost like human herbal medicine was an afterthought, you know, <laughs> and modern uh, herbal medicine for animals is mostly derived now from human herbal medicines. But a lot of things have been around forever, you know, uh, for animals. And so, you know, we know that. I mean, we, we know that humans and animals have been hanging around for a long time. You know, there is a, a painting from some cave wall. Uh, which shows two important things. First of all, that dogs and humans have been hanging around together for a really long time. And also documents, interestingly, the first uh, evidence of the miniskirt. So this is really very cool. You know, this guy's wearing a miniskirt and he's got a dog. So those two things have both been with us for a long time. And that's, that's good to know. Uh, <laughs> here's an old uh, <clears throat> oriental uh, illustration, you know, and when people had horses, 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, they were treating them with herbs, you know. Um, and in fact, here's another image 
which is another important historical document. It was shortly after this painting was done that human herbal medicine was painted, I mean, was invented, because as you can see, uh, this fellow's giving his horse an herbal enema, uh, and all four of the horse's feet are off the ground, and he's about to kick the berjeebers out of this guy. And there is evidence that that may have been why they invented human herbal medicine to save him from the horse. So <laughs> hard to say, but they've been doing it for a long time. Uh, here's another old guy with his dog out hunting or going to war or something. Who knows? He looks like an Assyrian or something fun. And here's another image that's uh, old about, uh, and this one's sort of controversial. There's a lot of debate about this particular image. Some people say that this is clearly an image of humans giving herbal medicines to dogs. Uh, others on the other side of that debate say, no, this guy's looking for the duck that this dog was supposed to retrieve. And uh, anyway, there, there's some, some argument about that. But the fact is uh, humans and animals have been along, around together for a long time and humans have been giving those animals herbal medicines for a very long time. Um, so how do you do it? How do you get herbs into a dog? Well, dogs aren't too bad. Most dogs will eat herbs. And in my veterinary practice, it was very, very rare for a dog to leave the building without a little bag of green powder, right? That's usually how I medicated dogs with herbs, just with the powdered herbs. Um, and most dogs will go for that. Uh, you mix it with a little wet food and piece of cake, you know? Uh, occasionally, rarely, you'll get a little Yorkie or Pomeranian or something and they look at that and say, I don't think that's food. And so, you know, you squirt a tincture in their mouth. Here, sport, you think that's food, right? But <laughs> most of them will do it. Most of them, you put the powder with a little wet food and, Presto, you know, you have a medicated dog, They're pretty easy. Um, cats are a little different. Cats can be harder to get herbs into. And uh, just one point in case you don't know, and that is that cats are sharp everywhere. Okay, so having them do it voluntarily is much better uh, <laughs> than doing it uh, to them. Um, but you get a little different results sometimes uh, with a cat. You add the powder to the wet food and you get a different response uh, than you do with the dog. But some cats will go for it. Some cats are really good sports. Um, I have a lot of cats in my practice. You know, anytime I joke around about cats being hard to give herbs to, half of my staff at the vet clinic would say, my cat takes her herbs every day. What are you talking about? And so it depends on two things. It depends on what herb it is, you know, and it depends on what cat it is. The thing with cats that's interesting is that their noses are hardwired into their brains to identify food. And if they don't smell it, they don't think it's food. I mean, literally, it's not an attitude thing. It's a hardwired biology thing. If a cat can't smell the food, it can't identify it as food, even if it's looking right at it. Uh, and so, I mean, they actually did a study on cats that were having chronic sinus infections. And in humans, there's a surgical procedure where they, I don't know what they do, shoot some kind of roto-rooter thing into your nose and, and grind out your sinuses to open them up so they can drain in cases of really severe chronic sinus infections. Um, and they decided to do that on cats. Some researchers said, let's try this on the poor kitties. They get horrible sinus infections. Let's see if we can help them the way that we help their people, right? And they drilled out their sinuses and every single cat in that study died of starvation. Every single one. Why? Because they couldn't smell food anymore. It affected their sense of smell and they could be starving to death and look at a bowl of cat food and not recognize it as food because their nose wasn't getting it and their brain can't do it if their nose doesn't do it. So cats are, you know, it's not their fault. It's a, it's a, a wiring problem with cats. Um, and so sometimes you do have to give cats uh, a tincture, you know, or you can mix up the powder in a little water and squirt it into them. Uh, tinctures in cats work very well. It's, it's important to get the tincture all the way in the back of their mouth because if it, is in the front, sometimes they'll just froth and foam for a long time uh, and they make this noise and glare at you while they're doing it, you know, uh, and it doesn't hurt the cat, but they take it personally. So be careful with that. Get it far back and you win. Um, and of course, you know, if you are going to give tinctures or things to cats involuntarily, it's good to dress appropriately. You know, there's the modern look here, or if you're, you know, more into classical fashion, of course, you can do it the old way. Um, but, uh, it's <laughs> like I said, cats are sharp everywhere. So <laughs> you get to do that once for free. And then after that, it's, uh, dragging them out from under the bed in a wrestling match. So ideally 
if you can put the little few drops of tincture or the powder into some really strong smelling fishy cat food, sometimes you can get away with it. And like I said, some herbs, you know, if you're giving him burdock or marshmallow, he'll eat that, right? But if you're giving him Oregon grape, you better have some pretty stout smelling cat food. All right. Um, all right. So dosing for pet, and I'm not going to go through all this. Uh, you can look at it. And also um, on the website, it's every product page has an info and dosing tab. Click on that. It'll show you the dosing. And by the way, speaking of websites, uh, we have a brand new website. Um, the original website is homegrownerbalist.net, and it's still there. And that's, you know, formulas for absolutely everything. And they're human formulas. But I created those formulas so they'd work in dogs and cats, too. Uh, and goats and chickens and aardvarks. And, I mean, they'll work in anybody. Um, but we just, a week or two ago, launched a new website, herbpet.com. And so herbpet.com has pet-specific formulas um, that are a little bit fine-tuned to make them even better for the critters um, and to address things that, you know, dogs have going on that humans don't sometimes. So have a look at that. Swing by herbpet.com and... Uh, have a look, buy some herbs that make us both feel happy inside and your dog uh, or your cat. Also, like I said, we'll be covering other topics. Uh, and if you subscribe to the video, to the channel rather, you'll get a heads up when I'm doing something about chickens or goats or whatever. Okay, so click that subscribe button. That'll be good too. All right. Oops. <clears throat> uh, just a general note on dosing for pets or humans. And that is, that if it's a chronic maintenance kind of thing, twice a day is usually what you do, you know. But if it's an acute emergency thing or if you're fighting off a bug or whatever, you're going to want to do it more than twice a day, right? You're going to do it three or four times a day, maybe more, depending on what you're dealing with. And we'll talk about that specifically uh, with some of these things uh, today. Getting herbs into other critters, you know, cows, goats, pigs, chickens, sheep, that's easy. All right, all those guys think weeds are candy. And so, you know, the only challenge there is outrunning them when they're chasing you around the pen for seconds, right? So <laughs> I've never had any trouble getting herbs into herbivores. You know, they're they're easy. Um, and like I said, we'll talk more about those kind of critters in another video. So let's just talk about a few of these issues. Um, we're going to talk about nutrition issues. We're going to talk about worms. We're going to talk about if infections, immune support things inflammation and arthritis. We'll talk about digestive issues, urinary issues. We'll talk about ringworm, snake bite wounds. This is just a few things, right? I mean, like I said, we could, we could do this all weekend and not begin to scratch the surface. You can do a ton of things with herbs and animals. Uh, but we need all you guys to get some sleep tonight. So we're only going to go for a little while <laughs> on a few topics. All right. So let's get started. So let's talk about nutritives and prebiotics, right? Nutrition things that we can do with herbs. Um, and most people think about dogs and cats as predators. I mean, they are, they're predators, right? Tell your Yorkie that, he'll get really excited. Uh, and, and when we think predator, we think meat eater, right? Well, what does a meat eater eat? Well, he eats herbivores, right? And he, does, he doesn't just eat the meat, he eats the whole thing. And in fact, when a pack of wolves or a lion or any of the predators take down a herbivore, the first thing they eat is the salad bar. You know, they go right for the gastrointestinal tract and that's the thing they eat first. And what are they eating there? Well, they're eating pounds and pounds of plant material from the GI tract of that animal. In a deer, you know, there's 20 or 30 pounds, 20 or 30 gallons rather, volume, of plant material. They have four stomachs, you know? So when a lion kills a wildebeest or a zebra or a wolf kills a deer, or a coyote kills a calf, you know, they're getting a lot of plant material in their diet. And they have to have that, you know, that it's, it's a part of their diet. Um, sadly, the pet food industry doesn't see that. And the only plant they think you need in your dog food is corn, right? And so you take some processed meat and you take some corn and you poke a vitamin in it. And what do you got? Corn dogs, right? No, <laughs> no dog food, right? Dog food. It's like corn dogs, but it's dog food. 
uh, and what does corn do for dogs? <clears throat> well, it's just basically broken down into simple sugars, which escalate insulin, which increases inflammation and increases fat and increases uh, joint pain and immune issues and all kinds of other problems, disrupts normal gut flora, right? Because we're not supposed to eat that much sugar. And your body or your dog's body can't tell at all the difference between cornmeal and cotton candy. It's all broken down into glucose, okay? And so those simple sugars are not something that a dog or a cat or a predator or a human would ever see in the wild. They would never see that. They're not designed to eat hardly any of that kind of thing, you know? I mean, a bear might find a honey, honey comb and good for him, but it's not a major part of his diet. You know what I mean? So what your pets really need are plants, real plants, not corn. Uh, and herbs are a phenomenal source for that plant material. <clears throat> They're really, really good sources of a number of vitamins. They're really complex. Uh, they're really good sources of a lot of weird micro minerals that you just need a little bit of it. But if you don't get it, you're in trouble. You know, boron and manganese and magnesium and all these weird little guys, you know, that aren't famous like iron and calcium, <laughs> but they're critical in micro doses. And, you know, the same thing's true with humans. We're not getting a lot of that stuff anymore either because we're eating food that's produced on fields that have been farmed for 50 years and, and never had any minerals put back on them. You know, the only thing they ever put on them is, you know, potassium and, and uh, ammonia and I'm going to have a mental block. Anyway, phosphorus, right? I guess two of those are minerals, but they're not putting any boron or manganese or, you know, any of the other little weird things that exist in nature. You know, they're just making plants grow big and pretty but they don't have the density of nutrition that a burdock weed has or a comfrey plant or somebody else that's grown in the wild with a 12 foot root and really pulling up a lot of goodies. You know what I mean? So the vitamins and the minerals are really important and really uh, important to get into your diet and your dog's diet. And the other is the prebiotics. So what the heck's a prebiotic? Well, you know what a probiotic is, right? That's bacteria. The, you know, you buy little capsules of good guy bacteria for your gut, right? Because your gut is chock full of beneficial microorganisms. In fact, they outnumber our cells 10 to 1. So for every cell your body has, there's 10 little happy bacteria and amoebas and other good guys in your guts, protozoans. Amoebas usually aren't good guys. Anyway, single-celled critters in your gut that are doing important things. They're modulating your immune system. They're producing serotonin, which is the chemical that makes your brain think it's happy. Uh, they're in facilitating digestion and the nutrient absorption. They're doing all kinds of critical stuff. And so, you know, you can buy probiotics, uh, which are those bugs, and you can give them to your dog or you can take them. And that's great. But what's a prebiotic? A prebiotic is the food that those guys need to eat. Right? It's an insoluble fiber blend. And one of those insoluble fibers, for example, is a, is a fiber called inulin, which is super common in herbs like burdock and elecampane and dandelion and any of the other guys that have deep, long tap roots. Okay? And so taking a probiotic is great, but taking a prebiotic so that those guys have something to eat when they get there is a really good idea. Right? Otherwise, you can invite them to the party and there's no lunch. Yeah, so that's no fun. So uh, this formula here, this nutritive and prebiotic formula, this is a formula that's on our herbpet.com, all right? And we also have a human version on homegrownerbalist.net. And so this is basically some high density vitamin and mineral herbs and some high density prebiotic content in them. Uh, there's just a great thing to add to your dog or cat's diet. Throw it in with his food and they'll eat it. And, it's, and it'll give them a lot of the things that they would be getting if they were getting a real mouse or a real chicken or a real wildebeest, right? All right. Don't let your dogs eat wildebeests. They're messy. Okay. So speaking of guts, let's talk about worms, all right? Um, unlike humans, all dogs live in a third world country where their neighbors poop on the lawn, right? 
and they explore everything with their mouth. And so their risk of contagion from parasites and diseases is much higher than our risk living in our fancy clean houses with flush toilets and soap and water. And so worms are still pretty common, even in, uh, you know, dogs that live in fancy places. Um, and there's basically two kinds of worms that we see commonly in dogs. There's round worms and tapeworms, all right? And round worms are easy to catch and easy to transmit. It's a fecal oral transmission, okay, which means the dog has to eat poop, right? Or he has to eat something that touched poop. So he's out in the yard monkeying around eating grass and, you know, licking everything and exploring everything in his mouth and he gets worms eggs in his mouth and then he gets round worms, okay? It's a pretty simple cycle. Um, tapeworms are more complicated. Uh, tapeworms are segmented worms. They're flat, right? So round worms look like spaghetti. Tapeworms are flat and segmented. And usually when you see a tapeworm on your dog or your cat, it's actually just one little segment stuck to his caboose that's sort of crawling around, that, that one little segment. You very rarely see the whole worm. Um, but the segments break off and have eggs in them. And so uh, the life cycle of a tapeworm is more complicated. To get a tapeworm, uh, you have to eat the intermediate host. And for dog tapeworms, there's only two intermediate hosts. It's either fleas or mice. And cat tapeworms too. Okay. And so in order to get uh, tapeworms, you have to eat fleas or mice. Unless you're wanting human tapeworms, and then you don't have to eat a cow that's not properly cooked. But that's how we get our tapeworm. That our, our intermediate host is a cow which is nicer than eating fleas. That was nice of God to think about that for us. But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, herbs are good for both. Uh, you can get uh, herbs that will kill tapeworms or roundworms. Um, this is the formula that I use, and it's pretty effective. Is it as effective as chemical pharmaceutical wormers? Probably not, but it'll get rid of most of them and bring them to a natural level, you know. Um, some of the herbal wormers or pharmaceutical herbal wormers are very safe, and some of them aren't. Uh, but this one's safe. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about um, heartworms. Heartworms are transmitted by mosquitoes. All right, they don't live in your guts, and you don't get them by eating something dumb. You get a heartworm by having it injected into your skin by a mosquito. All right, that's how it's transmitted, or a biting fly. Horse flies and guys like that can do it too. But it's mostly mosquitoes. Um, they live in the circulatory system. They tend to accumulate in the heart, in the chambers of the heart, in the blood. Um, and in high levels, they can be extraordinarily dangerous to dogs. Cats almost never get them. They can get them, but it's really rare. It's not a cat parasite, it's a dog parasite. And parasites are pretty host specific, you know. Um, a worm that a dog gets usually doesn't know what to do if it gets in a human. You know, if a human eats a worm egg that goes to a dog, the egg won't mature. It won't know what to do. Uh, there's very specific pH and chemical triggers that tell that little guy what to do and where to go and what to be. And if you're the wrong species, it doesn't work. Okay. And so um, cats can get injected with heartworms and sometimes they'll get a worm or two or three and, you know, have heartworms, but it's rare that they get them at all. And it's very rare that they get enough to, to be as dangerous as it is to dogs. Dogs can get a lot of them. It's really common in the South. Um, but it's getting more common in other places because, why? Because we're a more mobile society. And dogs from Alabama are moving to Maine. And I'll tell you a funny story, not funny, a sad story. When Hurricane Katrina happened years ago, um, there were thousands and thousands of dogs that were homeless and ownerless. You know, nobody knew who their mom was. They just had a hurricane for crying out loud, right? So they gathered up some wonderful organization, gathered up all these stray dogs and was taking care of them. And the company that makes the heartworm test, and I don't remember, there's a couple of companies, I don't remember which one it was, but one of those companies said, hey, why don't you test all those dogs for heartworm? And they sent a whole semi-loaded heartworm test down there and they tested all the dogs and sent the data back to the company. And the company said, you know, and it basically said, you know, we tested a million dogs and 30% of them had heartworm or whatever it was. And the company said, well, this is great, but where's the individual dog data? And they said, oh, well, we didn't keep any of that. And the company said, but you identified them, right? And they said, 
Uh, no, we didn't. We thought you just wanted the data from the whole group. And in the meantime, they had shipped dogs all over the continental United States to save them and give them homes. But a lot of those dogs had heartworms. And that year I had in my practice, you know, half a dozen heartworm cases in Idaho. And I never have heartworm cases in Idaho, you know, but I had a half a dozen that year from dogs that, you know, had come up from the South and, and from dogs that hadn't come up from the South who probably got bitten by a dog who had come up. You see what I'm saying? And so the, the incidence of heartworm is expanding a little bit. The bad news is there is not an herb that'll solve that problem for you. Okay. There are herbs that will kill heartworms. Um, but you have to prevent heartworms. Okay. And there's herbs that would prevent them, but the dosage and frequency you would have to use to prevent them with an herb like black walnut or something, uh, is not safe for a dog to give him as much as you need to give for as long as you need to give it is a bad idea. Okay. And so really the safest way, if you're in a heartworm endemic area, just put him on the heartworm meds. Okay. That's, that's going to be the safe thing to do. Um, I wish I had a magic wand and a, and a wonderful weed that could solve that problem, but I don't. Okay. And you'll read on the internet that this will kill him and that'll kill him. And it will sure you bet, but it's not safe at the dosing and frequency that you'd have to do to make it be a real solution. So no good news there, I'm afraid. All right. Let's talk about bacterial and viral infections. This is another area where herbs really shine. Um, and, uh, you know, this can be anything. This can be a respiratory virus. Uh, there's a brand new uh, canine influenza that's only been around for a few years. Well, I'm guessing, what, maybe three or four years? I, am, I have no concept of the passage of time. It hasn't been very many years. Anyway, it came from Japan. Um, and it was a horse flu. It was a horse influenza originally. Uh, and like all good influenza, it mutated so it could get into dogs or somebody else, right? That's why we get bird flu and swine flu, right? They mutate and jump species. Anyway, this horse flu jumped into dogs, and then it has to mutate again so it can jump from one dog to another dog. And all the influenzas have to do that. They have to mutate to go to another species, and then they have to mutate again to be transmissible between that members of that species, okay? So the dogs at the racetrack got the flu and then it mutated again and they started coughing on their neighbors. And it had been a little bit of a problem in Japan and other parts of Asia, but we didn't have any of it here. And then uh, a nice lady came to Chicago to a big dog show with her little dog from Japan. And that little dog had the flu. And the next thing we knew in the United States because it was a dog show, right? So she was exposing all kinds of all kinds of dogs from all kinds of places. And they all went home to all kinds of places because it was a big national show. And next thing we knew, we had influenza in every state in the union, canine influenza. So uh, <laughs> the good news is there's good herbs for respiratory viruses, um, influenzas and coronas. We've been fighting a corona global pandemic in dogs for as long as I've been in practice. Uh, and vaccines for some of the coronas are completely ineffective and for some are marginally effective and for some are pretty good. Uh, depends which corona it is. Every species has its own corona. Cats have one, dogs have one, pigs have one, cattle have, everybody has one. Humans have several. Uh, you may have heard of one lately, but anyway, uh, there are herbs that are very good for that. Um, and it could also be an infection. It could be a bacterial infection. It could be a wound that's infected. It could be, you know, a bite wound or a sore throat. Strep throat uh, is one of the very few diseases that's transmissible from humans to animals and vice versa. So if you have strep throat in the family, don't kiss the dog or he'll get it and then he'll kiss you back in a week and you'll get it again. Okay. Uh, anyway, most infections are not transmissible like that between humans and dogs. Um, rabies is also don't kiss your dog if he's rabid, but, uh, ringworm is and not very many things, pretty rare. Anyway, strep is one of them. Um, but there's, so when you're fighting an infectious disease as an herbalist, what I do is I, I attack it on two flanks, right? One is with herbs that kill the bugs. Um, and one is with herbs that stimulate the immune system. So she can kill the bugs, right? So we're attacking from two, two different angles. 
Um, this formula here is uh, immunity and infection support. Um, and so it's got herbs like astragalus, which are immune stimulants, echinacea is immune stimulant, olives are immune stimulant. But those plants also have direct antiviral and direct antibacterial properties. And of course, you got uh, Siberian ginseng, which is a tonic for everything, including the immune system, uh, and calendula, which is antiviral, antibacterial. So it's a good formula. It's a good general formula. If you're fighting a very specific thing, there are more specific formulas on homegrownerbles.net, uh, you know, really powerful antiviral respiratory formulas. Um, that's another topic. In fact, look around on my YouTube channel. There's a thing on respiratory stuff for humans. Have a look at that. All right. Um, so inflammation and arthritis. This is another thing that I do a ton of in my practice. Um, dogs get arthritis, right? And it's really common in older dogs. And I've used this formula for years and years and years on dogs uh, with arthritis. I don't see it much in cats, um, but dogs get a lot. Cats occasionally do. Um, and I would say in my practice, I could probably count on one hand the number of dogs that were on medicine for arthritis. Most of them were just doing the herbs and doing fine. Uh, if they did the herbs and it wasn't quite enough, we'd put them on the meds. Uh, but like I say, precious few of, of, I don't know how many dogs were in my vet practice, you know, a lot, <laughs> thousands of dogs probably. Um, but anyway, only a handful were on meds. Most of them were just taking the herbs. So some herbs have a direct anti-inflammatory effect like willow. Willow has basically has aspirin in it. Okay. Uh, that's where aspirin came from, not from willow, but from spirea, which is another plant. The word aspirin is a spirea out of spirea that's where it came from uh, as, as many of our pharmaceuticals came from plants uh, willow very similar turmeric's anti-inflammatory other herbs relax muscles uh, black cohosh cramp bark other herbs calm the nerves directly um, like yucca or devil's claw things like that other herbs decrease inflammation not by doing anything direct but by stimulating the liver and kidneys to get junk out of your blood so it doesn't precipitate into your joints and cause inflammation, right? So you can take burdock or dandelion root and it'll make your knees feel better because it's cleaning your blood, okay? So this formula, this canine joint support formula, this is not one I would give to cats because I don't give aspirin-based herbs to cats. It's bad for them. Don't give aspirin to cats. Um, but I rarely see it in cats, uh, so I don't, you know, we don't, I don't have a cat formula. I, I certainly, you could certainly make one. I could make you one. Um, but uh, any of these herbs would be fine for the cat except the willow, right? So just take that one out if you're giving it to a cat. Um, but otherwise, uh, this is a great formula for arthritis and inflammation. Okay, digestive issues. So this is another common problem with dogs. Dogs eat a lot of dumb things and they get gut trouble, okay? Um, so, you know, I mean, I don't know how many cases of diarrhea and enteritis and constipation and everything you can imagine with gut things, parvovirus in dogs. Um, and the good news is that herbs are fantastic at resolving gut issues. They're really, really good. If you give the body what it needs, nine times out of 10, it can fix itself. Okay. And that's really true with, with digestive system things. So let's just look at this formula, this digestive support formula. And we'll talk about who's in here, okay? Marshmallow is like the most soothing stuff in the world. If you have a mucous membrane that's grumpy about anything, marshmallow is your, your go-to gal, okay? And she'll make everybody feel better. Ginger um, is good for stomach aches and stomach cramping and trouble like that. Chamomile is very soothing on a chemical level. It soothes the nerves in the gut, okay? So if you have diarrhea, what is that? Well, that's spasms right that's hyperactive gut muscles hyperactive peristalsis right things are moving too fast so they're not hanging around in the colon and getting the water reabsorbed like they're supposed to okay that's why you get running running stools and so chamomile calms the nerves down and tells everybody to have a nap and quit being so silly and hyper and then things hang around longer and the water gets absorbed and you have a firm stool like you're supposed to um, dandelion leaf is a liver tonic uh, so it improves digestion through bile channels, right? Um, 
Fennel is good for, uh, fennel is what they call a carminative herb. Carminative comes from an old word that, that means combing, right? Because we card wool, right? We comb it. Carminative comes from that same Latin root. Uh, so it's good for gas pains, colic, indigestion, babies with belly aches. Psyllium is a fiber, feeds the good guy bacteria and bulks the stool. And sage is in the mint family and all the mints are good for your guts. Sage is especially good because in addition to being calming, it's got some antibacterial effects against bad guy bugs. It doesn't bother the good guys. And it's a good astringent for diarrhea cases. So this formula, regard, and I've used these kinds of things on dogs for ages, you know, and it fixes about anything. If you have a dog that has food sensitivities, this formula can help them. Uh, and so, and that's a long-term maintenance thing. We're not going to cure that usually, but uh, this is a really, really great formula. It's one of my first grabs for anything to do with the guts. All right, let's talk about urinary tract troubles. So, you know, kidney and bladder problems are another area where herbs are really great. Um, bladder infections, kidney stones, FUS in cats. FUS stands for feline neurologic syndrome. Uh, which basically means they got crystals plugging up their tallywhacker. Okay, boy cats get it. Uh, and so they can't pee. That's bad for them. If the cat is not peeing or the dog, if urine's not moving, get them to the vet because their bladder will blow up, right? Or that hyperpressure will damage their kidneys. If they're not moving stuff at all, get them to the vet. Um, but if they are moving stuff at all, I can usually dissolve that stuff with herbs. Okay, I've, I've treated a lot of dogs and a lot of cats with herbal interventions, you know, dissolving stuff. There's a lot of herbs that are good at dissolving things in the urinary tract. Uh, parsley root and gravel root are rock stars for that. And then the other thing we do is we increase urine flow with things like dandelion leaf or corn silk, guys like that. Um, we can add astringent herbs like uva ursi that you know, acidify the urine and kill the bugs that way. Um, we can add marshmallow, which again is just soothing and also has some very particular activity in the bladder to treat bladder infections. Probably because it, you know, strengthens the mucosa of the bladder so it's not as easy for the bugs to get there. The bladder can fight it like it's supposed to because marshmallow's there and she loves him and so it must be okay. And so it just is able to fight better. It also provides some coating that makes adherence of the bacteria harder. Um, but it's marshmallows are rock star for, for bladder stuff. All right. Now there's another thing that's a little weird in dogs that people don't get, and that is urinary incontinence. And people get urinary incontinence. I get that, but they don't get it for the same reasons the dogs get it. Okay. The reason dogs get urinary incontinence is uh, it's it's a typically it's always a female dog and it happens when she's sleeping. Okay. So you can have the most housebroken dog in the world, really a good girl. And when she lays down and goes to sleep, the urine leaks out and she gets up and she's terribly embarrassed because she's a good girl. And she doesn't do things like that. It's very stressful for the dogs. And of course it's stressful for the moms and the dads that have to clean up the urine pill spill. But what is happening there? Well, what's happening is um, the, there's two sphincters in the bladder. Okay, there's the internal sphincter and there's the external sphincter. The sphincter is a little fish that closes the thing up so it doesn't leak. Okay, it's just a little circle of muscle, right? And the internal sphincter is involuntary. You don't have any control over that one. Uh, and it's an estrogen dependent muscle. So if there's not enough estrogen in the system, that sphincter can't work. The external sphincter is voluntary and could care less how much estrogen is in the system, right? This is a different deal. And so when the dog's awake, she keeps her voluntary sphincter closed, her external sphincter. But when she lies down and goes to sleep and the voluntary one relaxes a little, the involuntary one, the estrogen dependent one has been open all day and out comes the urine. Okay. So you see it when they're asleep or when they're really relaxed laying down. Um, it only happens really in older spayed dogs. And most dogs that you spay don't have that issue at all. It, you know, in my practice with my bazillion dogs that are in my practice, I might have, I mean, 
three or four incontinent dogs, you know, and, and I spay two or three dogs a day for all day, every day, you know, so it's not like there aren't a population of spayed females out there that are having trouble. But once in a while, because most of them, when, when you do a spay on a dog, you're doing an ovarial hysterectomy, you're removing the, the uterus and the ovaries. And so estrogen levels are going to crash. And why don't they go, in, go into menopause and, and have all those troubles? Well, because dogs make more estrogen in other parts of their body than humans do. Okay. And for most dogs, for 99.9% .9 of dogs, that's enough. And they're fine and they're and everything's great and they don't care that they're spayed. But for a very small percentage of dogs, as they get older, and now there's even less estrogen in the other parts of their body, they start having not enough to keep that sphincter closed. So what do you do? Well, if you're a, a you know a, a modern veterinarian, you give them estrogen pills, or you give them propranolol, which is another pharmaceutical that can solve the problem. But the problem with estrogen pills is they can they can increase cancer rates uterine and, you know, uh, mammary cancer rates. Spade dogs don't get uterine cancer, <laughs> but they can get mammary cancer and high estrogen will do that to them sometimes, you know, and it's not common for, you know, the estrogen pill to cause the cancer, but it's more common for dogs with mammary cancer if they have estrogen pills on board. And so there's some herbal things we can do. And they also contain estrogens, but they're phytoestrogens and they're not as intense and they don't seem to cause the problem. Herbs like black cohosh, uh, red clover, dong quai, all of those have phytoestrogens, plant estrogens in them. Okay. Um, herbs like red raspberry leaf tone and strengthen all of the musculature in that part of the body. Uh, and so there's there's herbs that we can use and, and they're pretty effective. Um, sometimes that's all you need, in my experience. Sometimes uh, you still supplement with a little estrogen, but you don't do it nearly as often. Maybe you're doing it once a week, you know, giving them a pill and then doing the herbs every day. So it just depends on the case. But in, but in a lot of cases, that herb formula is enough for an old dog with incontinence. All right, ringworm, right? So ringworm is actually not a worm. You knew that, right? Ringworm is a fungus. I don't know why they call it ringworm. And they call it ringworm because it makes a little circular lesion, but I don't know where they got the worm thing. Anyway, it's a fungus, um, and there are modern topical pharmaceuticals you can use on ringworm, which are very effective, and there's internal medicines you can use for severe cases of ringworm, which are very effective, usually, uh, but they're also not safe, okay? Internal antifungals, systemic antifungals taken internally are often really hard on the liver or really hard on the kidneys or really hard on the gut bacteria and kind of a mess. Uh, so whenever possible, I avoid those. Um, and I have treated a lot of cases over the years, topically with herbs, ringworm cases, and, and had good luck with it. Um, the only tricky thing about that is getting the tincture to stay on for a minute, because if the dog or the cat licks it off, it ain't going to help, right? And so, I mean, it might help a little internally, but it's not going to solve the problem, typically. And so, you know, if if... If the ringworm is on top of his head, <laughs> you're okay. If it's on his foot or his belly or anywhere else on his body, he can reach it with his liquor and you better put an Elizabethan color on him or something or, or the stuff won't stay on long enough to his job. And so these are the herbs I use. I use uh, black walnut, garlic, and calendula and bergamot. And people always say, garlic, I thought garlic was bad for dogs. It is internally. This isn't an internal product. And even internally, you have to give a lot of garlic, okay? Anything, any formula on homegrownerbalist.net or herb bet that has garlic in it, you can give internally a dog and they'll be perfectly safe. Okay, you have to give a lot of garlic to a dog. Uh, onions are the same way, they're toxic to dogs too, but they have to eat a lot of them. And what they do is they suppress uh, blood production to bone marrow. So you get anemias. Anyway, uh, this formula and the bergamot, just another note, the bergamot in this formula is not the essential oil bergamot. Okay, um, that's a completely different plant this is Monarda fistulosa, which is in the mint family. Uh, the bergamot that they make the essential oil out of it is a little citrus fruit from Southeast Asia somewhere. I don't even know. It's a little green orange from Thailand or something or Indonesia. Anyway, they have the same name. I don't know why. The Latin name. <laughs> That's why you use Latin names when you do a Google search, guys. Um, anyway, you put this tincture on topically, you know, 
and you do it several times a day, the more the merrier, and it'll kill the ringworm, in my experience. Uh, let's talk a little bit about essential oils. Um, I am not a fan at all of essential oil use in pets, unless you're extraordinarily aware of what you're doing. Okay. And even then, I'm usually not a fan. All right. Essential oils, some essential oils are very toxic to cats and small dogs. Okay. The bigger dogs have less trouble. Um, the other problem we're seeing in the veterinary profession is we're seeing dogs dying of liver failure because their mom has a diffuser in the house with essential oils in it. Right. And so it's a problem because dogs livers are different than humans livers and they metabolize things differently and they turn them into different stuff. If you give grapes to a dog, you can ruin his kidneys and kill him. What? How is that possible? It's because he turns them into something we don't turn them into. Okay. And it's a toxin and it kills their kidneys. And so, you know, then there aren't very many herbs that are dangerous like that. Grapes is one, uh, you know, garlic in high doses, onions in high doses, hops in high doses can be a problem. Anyway, there's a very, very few, but a lot of the essential oils can be a problem. And especially if they're inhaled, because really, in my opinion, God didn't make him essential oils. So we would inhale them right in high concentrations. That's not the plan. Maybe it's better to use things the way that nature sort of had them designed to be used, you know? Uh, and so essential oils topically is good inside your lungs. I don't know if that's as good inside of dog lungs. Don't do it. Okay. So, um, anyway, this is the fungal topical formula for ringworm. Um, and I would, you know, it says three to four times daily. If you do it more, it'll work better. Okay. For, more is better frequency wise. Okay, let's talk about venomous bites and stings. So I have a veterinary practice and I have a naturopath practice, okay? And so if you were a dog, you went to that building. If you were sick as a dog, you went to this building. And I saw, I live in Idaho, rural Idaho and deserty Idaho. And so we see rattlesnake bites once in a while in dogs. I never see them in the people. And why is that? Well, it's because when people hear that noise, they don't stick their head under the bush and say, why are you making that noise? Would you like to be friends, right? <laughs> it's always right on the dog's nose. <laughs> Because he was sticking his nose where it didn't belong. Um, and they are potentially deadly, you know, rattlesnake bites, but also spider bites, you know, hobo spiders, brown recluse spiders, black widows. Black widows almost never bite, okay? But hobos and brown recluses will bite you, especially the hobos. Uh, hobos look just like a lot of the wolf spiders. You can't hardly tell them apart without a microscope. I was an entomologist before I was a veterinarian. And it's hard. I mean, there's little tiny tidbits of difference under a scope to tell a hobo from a wolf. But you can always tell a hobo from a wolf because when you walk into the room, the wolf runs away and the hobo chases you. Okay, that's how you tell a hobo. They're very aggressive. But anyway, we see bite wounds from snakes and spiders. And I see a lot of spider bites in the humans. Uh, just not as many rattlesnakes. But the venom is the same. It's a very necrotizing, tissue-dissolving venom uh, because spiders don't eat things. They drink things, right? So they inject a venom with a high concentration of an enzyme called hyaluronidase, hyaluronidase that dissolves the glue that holds your cells together, which is hyaluronic acid, right? So it liquefies the tissue and then it drinks you through a straw. That's how spiders eat, okay? And rattlesnakes do the same thing. They're liquefying the mouse so he dissolves faster so they don't have a big lump on their belly when they're squirreling around in the desert, right? So it, it, it speeds up the digestion. So um, what do we do? Well, we use snake oil right? <laughs> uh, anytime a doctor calls herbs snake oil, say, thank you, doctor. You're absolutely right. They were fabulous for snake bites. Snake oil was actually made from echinacea root. And echinacea root is a rock star for venomous bites. Uh, and why is that? Well, because echinacea root inhibits that enzyme. It shuts it down. And anywhere I start a dog or a human that, from a spider or a dog from a rattlesnake, anywhere I start the herbs on that wound is where the tissue destruction stops in its tracks every time. I've never seen it progress after I start the herbs because echinacea does two things. It shuts down the enzyme and echinacea stimulates your body to make more hyaluronic acid, right? And so, you know, if your house is made of bricks, if those are the cells and the mortar holding the bricks together is the hyaluronic acid, 
right? And you throw the snake venom on it and it dissolves all the hyaluronic acid and the bricks start falling off. Echinacea stops that process and slaps more mortar on. Okay, so it's a rock star for, for venomous bites. And that's what they used to make snake oil out of. Anyway, uh, another herb in this formula is plantain that's great at pulling poison out of the body. Uh, marshmallow and marshmallow. We've talked a lot about marshmallow. If I only had five herbs, marshmallow would be one of those five herbs. But one of the things that's really remarkable about marshmallow is it stops tissue from dying. It, 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 if you have a wound, like I get wounds in the vet clinic all the time where the line is starting to form and they're going to have gangrene and everything's going to die and fall off on the other side of that line. If I get marshmallow on that topically and in that animal internally, in 12 hours, that line's gone every single time for 30 years. Well, probably not 30 years. I probably haven't been doing that for 30 years, probably 15 or 20 years. Anyway, it's every time it stops. It's, it's like marshmallow can talk tissue out of dying if it isn't dead yet. And so for these venomous bites, it's it's amazing. And then the other herb in that form is dandelion root, which is a liver and kidney tonic. So we're gonna eliminate toxins, right? That's what the liver and kidneys do. They get poison out of your body. And so this formula, like I said, I actually created this formula. My, my daughter was a student. She's up in college and she got bit on a hand by a brown, by a hobo spider. And she starts getting this big circle on the palm of her hand and goes to the doctor and he says, I'm sorry, sweetheart. That's a hobo bite. You're going to slough half your palm and there's nothing I can do for you. But he put her on an antibiotic, even though there was no infection. Because <laughs> you got to do something, right? <laughs> anyway, it wasn't, that wasn't the answer she was looking for. So she came running home to daddy, the herbalist. And I actually created this formula for her that day. I just took the powdered herbs, mixed them with water, made a poultice, and then poked it in her every three hours or so internally, changed the poultice several times during the day. And within 12 hours, that circle that was starting to form was gone. Within 24 hours, the pink was gone and she never lost any tissue or had any more trouble with that bite. Okay, so that's when I started really getting serious. And, and a week later, I had a little dog come in that had been bitten on the nose by a rattlesnake. A little puppy was probably three months old and his head was the size of a volleyball, right? And they had found, he lived out in the desert and they found his brother dead under the bush next to the rattlesnake and him laying next to his brother with his head all swelled up. And anyway, brought him in and I couldn't put it on him topically because he's a puppy and how do you put herbs on a puppy's nose topically? You know, some things can't be done <laughs> and hope to leave them there. Uh, but I gave him the formula internally and in 12 hours, his head was normal sized and in 24 hours he went home, no tissue loss at all. Okay, so this is a tremendous formula. And since then, like I say, I've had Lots and lots of cases of snake bite and lots and lots of cases of, of spider bites. And it just works really great. Sometimes the weeds are better, guys. As a, as a modern veterinary surgeon, I got nothing for rattlesnake bites except anti-venom, which I don't have. You know, I mean, I guess if I drove to Boise, I could buy some, you know, at an emergency clinic for 300 bucks a bag. But the weeds work beautifully. All right, let's talk about some wounds, okay? So another thing I do a lot of as a veterinarian is wound cases, and I just want to warn you. I have a slide in there that warned you, but it disappeared. There's going to be some graphic images, and I'm sorry. Cover your eyes. Uh, if you're a sensitive individual, you should cover your eyes to watch the rest of this, okay? Um, anyway, this is Juno. Juno got run over in her driveway. She's a little old lady. And she can't see very good and she can't hear very good and she isn't very fast. And her dad was driving home and she saw him driving up the driveway and she ran out to tell him she loves him and he ran her over because he didn't see her. And she wasn't fast enough to get out of the way. Uh, three days and it broke her hip in like several places. Um, three days later, all of this skin died and fell off. Right? Excuse me. All the skin died and sloughed off. And what do you do with that? You know, and so what we did with that is we used herbs. All this dog got was herbs. And this is her later. Okay. The wound is completely healed. She has a little scar there, but that is a manageable comb over for an Alaskan Eskimo. All right. Oops, I keep pushing the wrong button. All right. Here's Reggie. And uh, Reggie was a cat. I don't know if you could tell that right away, but. Uh, I can assure you he was because I am a trained professional. Reggie uh, had some trouble with his staff. 
Uh, sometimes they wouldn't let him in when he called at the door. Uh, and so he got in the habit of crawling under the hood of the car on cold winter days because the engine of the car was warm sometimes. And uh, one day, uh, one of his staff members went to buy some catnip or something important and started the car while he was in there. And his foot got tangled up in the fan belt and tore all the skin off. This is called a degloving injury, right? We have taken the glove off and there's no more skin there. Uh, it's really important in the winter to tap your horn before you start the car if you live around cats because they like to get up there where it's warm. This is a cat <clears throat> who would do nothing internally. Juno got herbs internally, okay, because uh, she's a dog. Reggie wouldn't have anything to do with it. I gave him the food with the herbs in it and he looked at me and like, I'm sorry, didn't my staff tell you that I only eat cat food, right? <laughs> and so he wasn't going for it. And so this was actually an experimental case and I only used the uh, herbs topically on him. That's all I did. And here's his foot. I think this is three weeks, if I remember right. Go to the blog, you can find it. Go to homegrownerbos.net to the blog. There's a lot of wound cases, human and cat and dog. Uh, similar situations. I've done a lot of these over the years. Anyway, he healed right up with the herbs. Uh, here's another little dog. This is a dog that had uh, a little loss up, so, and, sh and she had, or a Shih Tzu. One of those little fuzzy guys, I can't remember. Anyway, her name was Morgan, really a cute, sweet little dog. And she broke her leg and another vet put a cast on it. I hate casts on dogs because they get wet. They run out to piddle in the morning and the dew gets on the cast. The cat swells up and you get a pressure sore. I never, I never, ever put casts on dogs. Um, if they have a fractured bone, uh, I'm, I'm probably going to do surgery and put a plate on the bone. Uh, if not, I might do a splint that I can take off and change bandaging if it gets wet, but I don't do casts on dogs, okay? Anyway, some other nice fellow put a cast on this one and it started to stink and the owner says, oh dear, something's wrong. She brought her to me and I looked at it and I said, yep, she's got a cast and she got a pressure wound and I cut the cast off and took her to surgery and put a plate on the bone so it wouldn't, would be done. But then what do you do with this wound? I mean, these are her, you know, ligaments and nerves, these little white structures here. I mean, that's a deep, deep wound. And all we did was herbs on her. This is seven days later. Okay, it's insane how fast this helps. Uh, all right, so how the heck do you do that? How do you heal wounds like that? Right, that's kind of startling, isn't it? These guys are very startled. And uh, this is how you do it. This is the formula. Okay, it's the poultice formula. And for many, many years, I did the poultice formula as a poultice. I was Mr. Poultice, man. I was out preaching the poultice all over the country and all over the Western states. Anyway, uh, I was a real uh, evangelical about pro pro poultices and loved them and used them all the time in my vet practice. Um, and then I had several cases that were impossible to poultice. And I started making a tea out of the same formula and spraying it on. And then I got thinking, why am I making a tea? Why don't I use a tincture? But an alcohol tincture is too, you know, you don't want to spray that on a wound. I mean, even I had that figured out before I did it. Uh, and so I diluted it with some water. So I put a teaspoon of the tincture into two to four ounces of water and put it in a little spray bottle and I spray it on, right? Most tinctures, if you're using them topically, like that fungal ringworm thing you just use the tincture straight right there's a lot of herbs we can use topically for a lot of things we can have a whole nother conversation about that someday uh for pain and for all kinds of cool things but anyway for this formula this is the only one where i mix the tincture with a little water just so it doesn't sting because the alcohol will sting and it works great the, and, and the nice thing about it is it's way less work it's way less mess the tincture has a shelf life of years and years and years and so it's there when you need it. You know, if you buy powdered poultice, it's good for a year or two. You know, powdered herbs are good for a year or two, but tinctures last for a long time. And so if you have a bottle of this poultice tincture on your cupboard shelf, it'll be there five years from now when all of a sudden you need it real bad. And you just mix it with a little water and spray it on. Now, when you mix it with water, now the shelf life's two or three days, right? Keep it in the fridge. But until you mix it, it's it's lasts forever. And you put you know, you mix up your little bottle and you mix up a fresh bottle every two or three days, right? You make a little bottle of it. Um, but it's truly amazing. The wound healing properties of this formula are astounding. And it's not because I'm 
a genius or magic or anything. These are just rock star herbs. Okay. These are herbs people have been using for forever. Okay. And, and this is a formula I developed and it's got a lot of great guys and it comfrey accelerates healing. It's, it causes cells to divide way faster. Um, so it decreases wound healing times. Calendula is an antibiotic and an anti-inflammatory, and it also accelerates healing. Plantain pulls poisons out and it accelerates healing. Uh, marshmallow, remember, talks tissue out of dying and is also very soothing. Lobelia is an antispasmodic. Why do I have an antispasmodic in, an, in a wound formula? Why do I want a muscle relaxant in a wound formula? Well, that's a good question. It's because it's an antispasmodic and it's relaxing the musculature, the micromusculature around the microvasculature of the wound area so the good stuff can get in and the bad stuff can get out. Okay, so it's improving blood flow. Uh, yarrow is another good antibiotic and anti-inflammatory and it stops bleeding if you had a bleeding wound. And cayenne, and cayenne, there's just a pinch of cayenne in here, but cayenne does three things. One, it stops bleeding. Two, it's got some antibacterial properties. And three, it has some pain killing properties that involve substance P. It actually, when you put it on the first second, it's quite zingy. And then all of a sudden it's less painful. And so that's a great formula. I've used it, I don't even know, countless times. And it always works. I mean, I've never used this on a wound and not been like, holy cow, I can't believe what this is doing. I still can't do the poker face. <laughs> I still look surprised and amazed every time. <laughs> it's a great formula. Go to herbpet.com and buy a bottle of that and stick it in your medicine cabinet for when you're dog does something bad or your husband does something bad and whacks his finger open or something or your brother-in-law whacks his leg open with a chainsaw during the apocalypse the wounds we've healed are astounding go to go to homegrownerbalist.net which is the other website and look at the blog and look, look at some of those wound cases all right oh we did that okay okay so that's it um so just a reminder if you want more depth and more information and a real really fun and deep and applicable real world herbal education swing by to homegrownherbalist.net and have a look at that homegrown herbalist Go botanical medicine it's vastly cheaper than it should be it's you'll have lifetime access to everything and you'll get trained by a guy that actually does this stuff all day um which is good um also if you haven't read the books there's some good herbal education there those are available on homegrownherbalist.net too if you uh, signed up for this website through through the, for this, what is this, a presentation? Yeah, something like that. If you signed up for this <laughs> webinar, that's what it is. <laughs> it's a YouTube live stream, that's what it is. Anyway, if you signed up for this through the website, we already have your email probably, and we'll send you a PDF of all these slides, okay? If you just stumbled on it on YouTube somehow, I'm glad, uh, send me an email, and I'll send you the PDF for the slides. Just send an email to info at homegrownerbalist.net. Right. Formulas for humans, if you got human trouble. Um, we got herb kits, we got the school, we got a lot of things. Also, there's a YouTube channel, which you probably know because you're watching a YouTube video, right? But we got a lot of other herb, herb videos, so that's fun too. So thanks for listening, I appreciate it. Let's look at some questions, shall we? Um, so here's the two websites that I've been yakking about all night, homegrownerbalist.net and herbpet.com. We just launched Herb Pet a week ago, and we'd be very, very grateful if somebody bought some herbs. That'd be fun. All right. We want to see if anybody wants that stuff. So show us you do. All right. Also, uh, let's get to some questions. So I'm going to see if I can make this work. Look, I can make it work. Okay. So, um, Stephanie says, I have two golden doodles and was wondering what to do about the black buildup in the ears. We clean the ears out. Doc, you mentioned this is allergies. What can we do to alleviate? Okay. <clears throat> it might be allergies. Sometimes it's just dirt in their ears and you clean it out. But if they're inflamed and gooky and stinky and bad, it's an ear infection. Okay. And almost without exception. Once in a while, if you have a dog that swims in the canal or something, or you give him a bath and you don't put cotton balls in his ear, he'll get an ear infection from the water, right? The water gets all warm and happy and it's a great place to be a yeast and the next thing you know, got an ear infection. And you, you treat that and clean it out, you know, make some calendula tea and clean that out or some garlic and calendula or something like that. Clean it out and you kill those bugs. But almost always, 
if a dog has ear infections, it's because he has allergies. Okay. The histamine releasing cells, which are the symptom generating cells in an allergy case, right? In humans, they're mostly in our sinuses and respiratory tract in our eyes. And so when we have an allergy, we sneeze and wheeze and ball, right? In dogs, they're mostly concentrated in the skin and they're heavily concentrated in the ears and in the feet for some reason. I don't know why. So when a dog has allergies, even if it's something he's inhaling, he gets itchy skin and he gets ear infections and he chews his feet because they itch like crazy, right? And so what do you do about that? Well, we didn't cover that tonight because it's a huge topic. All right. Um, but there's basically two things you can do. You can, we need to do a, a video about, I think, didn't I do a video about this on immunity? And anyway, I don't know. <laughs> we cover it in, in a lot of depth and detail in the school. Um, but go to the immunology, the immune system modules and, and the autoimmune modules and look there. That's where all the allergy stuff is. Anyway, um, basically, short answer is try an elimination diet. Some dogs are allergic to corn or beef or chicken. Those are the three foods they're usually allergic to, which are the three foods their dog food's usually made of. So go to one of the big pet stores and buy something weird like lamb and rice or duck and pea or aardvark and sweet potato, some protein and, and plant he's never seen before and feed him only that, no table scraps, no Cheetos, no nothing else, or you don't know anything, right? Feed him only that novel food and see if his allergies go away. If they do, it's a food allergy and you win. Just don't feed him other stuff, right? Just feed him the stuff he's not allergic to. If it doesn't solve the problem, it's not a food allergy. And oftentimes it's not. And when we do allergy testing on dogs, it seems like they're always allergic to 30 different things. You know, they're allergic to bee pollen and dust mites and pine trees and sagebrush and, you know, dog hair, <laughs> you know, all kinds of things. And so, um, now you got an allergy. And so what do you do? Well, um, in most of those cases, you can't eliminate him from exposure. And so you got to manage it. And there's two things you can do to help manage it. One is with antihistamine herbs, uh, like Brigham tea, like nettles, like eye bright. Um, those have direct antihistamine effects. And the other thing you can do is you can stimulate and support the liver. Well, why does that help? Well, it's that helps because the liver is the organ that removes histamines from the body. Okay, so the happier your liver is, the fewer allergy symptoms you have. Um, we have a formula on homegrownerbalist.net called histamine. Okay, and we have a formula called liver support and liver builder. Those are the three I would look at for an allergy case. Now, the problem is that with dogs, very much less so with humans, but with dogs, um, most things I do with herbs, with dogs, it's like slam dunk. You give the herbs, they do their thing, works every time, okay? The exception to that is allergies. And the reason is, I think, that sometimes dogs have a lot of plant allergies and you're giving them plants to try and solve their plant allergy, right? And that, <laughs> that doesn't work sometimes. And so with allergy dogs, I give them the allergies and, you know, maybe a third of them come back and think I'm really smart and two thirds come back and say that didn't do anything. Right. And those dogs have plant allergies and it doesn't make it any worse, but it doesn't help to use the plants. Okay. In my experience. All right. So, um, all right. So ET phone home says, oh my goodness, I'm so blessed to catch you live. I love your channel. Oh, I'm glad you found us. That's good. Um, Stephanie says, I'm a new student in the online classes, really enjoying the information. Stephanie, I'm really glad. I'm glad you're liking it and having a good time. I like having students. It's so fun to interact with these folks. All right. Um, Judy says, I hope you'll do some stuff for goats and poultry. We absolutely will, Judy. I've had goats and poultry uh, on and off forever. <laughs> All right, Annie says, yay, waiting for this class. Uh, Linda says, love your videos for humans too. Good. Um, All right, other nice things, people about being students. Christy just got into the school, that's fun. 
Uh, Angela says hi. Paul says hi. Jamie says hi from Arkansas. Um, Linda says she's excited to hear it. And there's other people that are excited. Skin allergies in new dogs. We just talked about that. Itchy feet. Skin allergies in dogs. Same thing. Okay, if they're chewing their feet, they got allergies. Uh, unless they have a foxtail, right? They have a little hole. They have a foxtail. Go get that pulled out. Um, it seems like all I do in Idaho, I don't know where you live, but in Idaho, the only thing I do with dogs from June till about September is pull foxtails out. <laughs> all right. Very happy. Acre Homestead says he's happy to be here. We're happy to have you. All right. And Susan. Oh, here's Maniac says, my cat prefers ketchup over bovine colostrum. Well, there you go. Do what you got to do. Put some ketchup. <coughs> Try some ketchup on your herbs. <laughs> okay. Here's some more folks watching. All right. Christy says, I have a dog with inflamed inverted nipples. Suggestions to help. How do you keep her from licking any salve off? Well, the only way to lick salve off to keep from licking salve off is to mechanically keep her from doing it with an Elizabethan collar or, or some kind of collar. You can get them at big pet stores or your vet will have one. Um, but yeah, you know, some marshmallow on that, some calendula on that uh, would be soothing and kill the bugs. If it's a real inverted nipple that's chronically infected and always a miserable mess, then that's a miserable mess that's long-term maintenance and maybe it's better to get that thing taken off, you know? Um, but you know, the, the herbs like calendula, um, or yarrow topically, either of those, um, would be soothing. You can put some, uh, marshmallow with that and you can make a lotion, uh, in the school, we talk about how to make lotions, how to make salves, how to make fomentations and tinctures, anything you can imagine. How the heck do I make that? We cover it really in depth in the school. Uh, if you need help on the mechanics of making the stuff. And it's in my book, too, The Homegrown Herbalist, if you don't have that one or if you don't know. Okay. Um, okay. Paul says, what do you uh, recommend for cleaning Javi ears? Javi or Havanese, they're cute little uh, shih tzu looking cute little guys. Um, how do you clean the ears out? What would I use to clean the ears out? Well, you can make uh a tea and again you can just buy the tincture and mix it with a little water okay i wouldn't put the tincture in straight um or you can mix it with a little vinegar uh calendula is really good for cleaning out ears it's antibacterial it's anti-inflammatory it's antifungal what else you got right mm -hmm. so you can just clean that with a cotton ball if it's just an ear infection but if it's chronic again it's probably allergies you need to address that okay kathy says i'd love to hear about tick prevention um, and I don't have anything on tick prevention with herbs. I don't have diddly on it, uh, unfortunately. And ticks can be a serious problem. They can, you know, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Lyme disease, a lot of stuff. If you're in a high tick area, um, you probably need to use not an over-the-counter flea and tick product because some of those are really dangerous. Um, but go to your vet and get something. They'll have something. Don't use a flea collar. They almost never work. Uh, and they're yucky, but some of the spot ons are that you can get you from your vet are safe enough that I feel comfortable with them. Some of the ones you can get at the hardware store are not safe. And I've seen a lot of dogs in big trouble that have been treated with some of those. And I'm not going to name any names, but, uh, don't do that. Uh, for fleas, we didn't talk about fleas either. And there's not an herb you can give. I mean, There's not an herb you can give to really prevent fleas. Uh, there's things you can do, uh, but I'll tell you the very best thing for fleas is Dawn dishwashing liquid. Really, bathe your dog or your cat with Dawn dishwashing liquid. Shampoo him with Dawn soap like it's shampoo and leave it on for a minute and it'll kill the fleas. It's fabulous for that. And then put a, uh, you know, the only good thing to do with a, a, a flea collar is to put it in your vacuum bag so that it kills the eggs and the fleas that you suck out of your carpet when you vacuum. <laughs> That's a good use for a flea collar. Don't put it on your dog, though. <laughs> but anyway, those kinds of things. But the Dawn soap is my favorite way to get rid of fleas. Um, 
but there's not an herb you can give or put on them that's effective enough to be worth the bother. Okay. All right. Uh, Desiree Tassano says, I'm curious about your opinion on raw food diets, especially for cats. Um, I think raw food diets are vastly better than commercial dried diets or canned diets. If you can afford them and want to do it or make it yourself. Um, there's a couple of brands that are good. There's one called Primal. There's one called Nature's Variety. There's several others. Um, it's a little more expensive, but I'll tell you, I've seen cases of dogs with severe digestive trouble, you know, food sensitivities and stuff, or dogs with allergies that if you switch them to a raw food diet, they just go away. Right. Uh, even to the raw food diet, though, I would add the nutritive herbs to bring up the, the plant phyto nutrient levels. But yeah, raw food diets are a really good idea. You know, it's sort of amazing. But when we go back to doing the things the way God designed us to do things, everything works better. Right. So dogs were designed to eat raw food. They weren't designed to eat cooked corn dogs in kibble form. Okay, so it's it's a good idea to give them what they're supposed to eat. Okay. Um, Linda says her comfrey is up. That's fun. And Lynn talks about allergies and itchy feet. We did that one. Uh, Paul says graceful puzolza bush is abundant in our yard, and I read it's related to stinging nettle. May I use it as a nettle? Paul, I have no idea. <laughs> I've never heard of graceful puzzle bush. That's fun. Uh, I don't know. I don't know anything about that. That's uh, that's one we'd have to look up. Um, but I know that you can use nettles as nettles. That's what I use as nettles as nettles. Okay. Uh, Maniac says, I read that people can get heartworm. People can get heartworm sort of surpassingly rarely it's it's like we talked about with the cats and and it's even harder for a heartworm to figure out what's going on in a human than it is in a cat okay so it's not like the dog the mosquitoes full of heartworms are only biting dogs they're biting everybody but like i said parasites tend to be extremely host specific and if you put them in the wrong host they don't know what to do most of the time okay there's a few exceptions to that but not very many and there have been a few cases of humans getting heartworm uh, there have been a few cases of humans being born with two heads and four arms. Okay. I mean, that happens too. Also very rare. So it, it can happen, but like I said, it's very, very rare. Um, and, uh, not something you need to worry about. If you don't want heartworms, rub some lemon balm on your skin and the mosquitoes won't know you're a mammal because you smell like a mint or a lemon balm bush. Any of the real aromatic mints are great for, um, bug repellent. So there's a good way. Uh, the other way to not get heartworm is to be a human almost all the time. So that's, and I am, I'm a human almost all the time. Okay. So, um, uh, okay. Notice says, how do you treat recurring urinary tract infections? Well, that urinary tract formula is very effective. Um, and that's what, that's what I would do. I would also make sure that the dog doesn't have a stone, you know, go get an x-ray and make sure he doesn't have kidney stones or something. But if there's no stone, uh, you can use that urinary formula. And if there's a stone, you can use that urinary formula, <laughs> but at least you'll know what's going on. Um, I, <laughs> anyway, uh, can Moringa be used for my dog? 44 pounds. You know, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, if you will ask it in the comments below the video, I'll look it up. I, I don't use Moringa and have, I don't have a lot of exposure to it, so I'll have to check. Um, but that's a good question. Moringa is sort of the fashionable, new, exciting herb this week. So, uh, but yeah, I, don't, I haven't used it. I'll have to check. My 12 year old large dog has diabetes and is on insulin. Would the joint support be okay to use? Yeah, it would be okay to use. Yep. Um, what would you suggest to help? or pre to help prevent leptospirosis? Well, um, there's a really good vaccine for leptospirosis. The DHLPP vaccine has lepto in it. Um, 
the only way to get leptospirosis is to it's transmitted in the urine of the animal that has it okay so unless your animal lives on a farm or is hanging around where there's wildlife he probably won't get lepto anyway okay um but you know i would i would just do the vaccine and that's going to be astonishing to a lot of people to say what i thought he was an herbalist why does he like vaccines well it's like i said dogs live in a third world country okay they don't live where you live i mean it looks like they live where you live but it's a very different world for them uh and so their risk of exposure to things like parvovirus to things like lepto and parainfluenza and distemper and all those things is way higher you know than your exposure risk is to measles or mumps so for you to say i'm not going to give my kid a measles shot or mumps shot you know at some point everything is a risk right there's a risk benefit analysis and with humans in first world countries we're about to the point where we can start to say gee the risk of the vaccine is worse than the risk of catching measles right i mean all the other kids in this kindergarten class have been vaccinated how the heck is he going to get measles anyway you know and so you have to make those decisions and i'm not saying yay or nay on you know human vaccines that's a personal decision but on dog vaccines i'm going to say yay all right because you have to understand that, that their risk of getting a disease that might kill them is way higher because of their lifestyle and their the, the realities of the world they live in so if you don't want lepto get your dog a shot and and i would recommend that that you get you know the puppy shots when he's a little guy and you know i think we do over vaccinate our dogs uh, i don't think they need it every year probably but i i'm i am a proponent of vaccinating dogs now do I have clients that never vaccinate and don't have problems because they use a lot of herbs? Yeah, I do. But you better be doing that all the time. And you better be making some lifestyle choices with that dog that he doesn't go anywhere. And then it's okay. You know, and I have dogs that, you know, don't do uh, vaccines on the dog. I mean, owners, but they, but they, are giving immune support formulas and they're doing things as needed and, and their dogs don't get sick, but they don't ever leave the backyard and they don't, you know what I mean? And so it's, it's a risk benefit analysis and you got to do that for lepto, get the shot. All right. Um, I've had several dogs that love to eat Chinese elm tree leaves. Should I worry about that? No, Chinese elm tree leaves are good medicine <laughs> and they're good for you. Uh, if you ever have a there elm elm is slippery elm is an elm and they're all the same it doesn't matter if it's chinese elm or slippery elm that won't hurt them a bit thanks for this program doc i'm always blown away by your knowledge and even better the way you have of making things simple and easy to understand i'm glad kelly i'm glad all right linda says allergies go into the chest cough and rattle my little chihuahua looks like pain in his abs from half cough honey worked great for a week then he avoided it. Could it be pancreatitis? Uh, well, so pancreatitis won't have any respiratory symptoms. The cough doesn't have anything to do with pancreatitis. Pancreatitis symptoms uh, are typically vomiting, diarrhea, and severe pain in the cranial abdomen. That's pancreatitis symptoms. Um, it's very rare for a dog to have allergies result in a cough. If a dog has a serious cough, I'd get it diagnosed. Sometimes it's heart disease. You know, sometimes it's, I mean, it can be a lot of other things. It's, it, it's almost never allergies. So it might be good to get that little guy in. And you know what? I'm a proponent of that all the time. You know, people email me or call me or ask me questions and say, you know, my dog, I think he's got this, what should I do? And I said, you should take him to the vet and find if he's got that. And then once he's got that, now we know something and we can go on from there, right? Humans too. If you can't figure out what's going on, go to the doctor and get a diagnosis, right? They're great at diagnosing stuff. All right. Um, TBB Farm says, dog with recessed vulva has perivulvular dermatitis. Haven't found anything that works. Um, again, 
if it's a mechanical thing that's going to be chronically inverted and and wonky, you're going to have chronic fluid buildup in there, you know, and chronic inflammation and infection. You can manage that, uh, but you can't probably cure it because you'll catch it again next week because of the anatomical structure problems. It's probably a her if it's a vulva, right? It's probably not a him. Anyway, <laughs> she'll get it again next week. Uh, you could use that immunity infection formula. It, you know, if you get a tincture of that, you could spray that on. Uh, I'd probably put a little water in it if you're going on the vulva because that might be a little tender. Um, we have a formula on home ground herbalist called Bug Buster that you could make it, you know, the, put a little water in that to dilute it just a little if it's going on a vulva and spray that. Or, you know, and that will kill the bugs. But again, it's not going to cure the problem. You know, it's not going to, I mean, you'll cure it today, but in three days, he still has, she still has an inverted vulva and you're still going to have the trouble. You might be able to get a surgical solution for that. You know, sometimes, sometimes you need a good mechanic. You can solve a problem like that. Okay. Uh, my dog, where are we? My dog's highly allergic to bee stings. Is there something I could give her as a preventative to alleviate the severe reaction? Um, well, there's not something you could give her as, I mean, as a preventative. I mean, that histamine formula that we have on homegrownerbos.net is good. You know, I mean, if you knew she was going to get stung in 10 minutes and gave it to her, that'd be great. It would help as a preventative. But I don't know that I'd give it to her all day, every day. You know what I mean? Long term. Uh, probably better as a response than a prophylactic. All right. Rose says, thanks. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, Bert, we live in Connecticut and ticks are a big issue. Do you have any formulas and what are your thoughts on herbal topical tick formulas with essential oils in them? Like I said, I don't like essential oils typically on dogs, especially small dogs. Uh, they can be a problem. Um, I don't have any herb formula that'll, that'll solve a tick problem. I have some herb formulas that'll solve a Lyme disease problem afterward, but I don't have a problem. I think if you live in a high tick area and I'm an herbalist, okay, I'm a naturopath, I'm an herbalist, I'm as fringy as anybody you know, hugging trees. Sometimes I even wear tie dye. Okay, I'm serious and I'm committed. And I think if you live in a high tick area, you need to get some kind of a pharmaceutical spot on to protect your dog from ticks. Because the Lyme's disease and the Rocky Mountain fever and the other stuff is a disaster. And and what's the, you know, do the risk benefit analysis. You know what I mean? Um, we need to not have this turf war where everything that the other guys have must be bad. You know, and they think everything we have must be bad. That's dumb. We don't want to do that. Okay. They have some great tools. We have some great tools. The trick is to know all the tools and pick the one that's the great tool, you know, and sometimes the pharmaceutical is the great tool. Sometimes surgery is the great tool. Uh, sometimes the herb, oftentimes the herb is a great tool and sometimes it's a way better tool, right? Sometimes it's not. And in the case of ticks, it's not. Okay. Um, Okay, Jack says, I'm excited. I keep the Homegrown Herbalist book. I have the Homegrown Herbalist book on its way. Do you have a book about pet care? I don't, um, but I will soon because everyone here keeps telling me I have to. So <laughs> we are going to be doing, like I said, some serious modules in the school on pet stuff and, and livestock stuff. Um, but I'll probably end up doing a book here this year too. Some of the photos are missing on your blog. Can you put them back up? Oh yeah, you know, somebody emailed me about that a little while ago and I've been meaning to do that. I'll get them back up. There's a case on Miracle Max in a wound case that all the pictures disappeared because it was on a different website that I had a hundred years ago. Um, thoughts on diatomaceous earth for dogs. So diatomaceous earth is basically powdered fossilized diatoms, which were little tiny mineral rich critters that lived a long time ago. Um, and diatomaceous earth, uh, can have some effect internally on parasites. Um, it can scrape the mucus off is literally what it does. And then, and then they have, uh, trouble living in an acid and enzyme rich environment. If their protection is scraped off, it also has the same effect on insects. You can put it in your carpet and stuff, and it'll help with flea problems. You can put it in your dog's hair and it'll help with flea problems a little, but it's very high 
labor intensive and now you got diatomaceous earth all over your house. You know what I mean? Uh, but no, it's not harmful to dogs in any way. And it's sometimes helpful on some levels. Um, yep. Okay. Nona says, any new books in the near future? Yes, I'm working on a couple of books right now. I'm working on a book on medicinal trees. I'm working on a book on the mint family. And I'm working on, soon we'll be working on a book on veterinary stuff, animal stuff. We used the poultice formula on my daughter's boxer. She was attacked by another dog. Open wounds, drain surgery. Worked great. Very few scars. Amazing. That's from Diane. I'm so glad. One thing to be aware of that I forgot to mention. I'm glad you brought this up. Um, it is wise to be very careful using comfrey on a small puncture wound. Because sometimes it'll seal them up too fast and then you get an abscess. Okay. Uh, if it's a cut or a tear or any kind of other wound, if the opening's big enough that stuff can drain out of it, don't worry about it, use it. But if it's a really deep, narrow channel, like from a puncture wound, uh, comfrey's probably not your best bet. On that case, I would probably use calendula and plantain because uh, they also have some mild uh, wound healing properties, but it's not as fast, so things sort of heal from the inside out. Okay. Um, Half Acre Homestead says, I own both of the books, use them all the time. I'm glad. I'm glad. All right. Can you repeat the treatment for a dog that had the open wound on his leg and hip? So bad it couldn't be done with stitches. Oh, the wounded. Yeah. You used a poultice to prevent gangrene. You spoke about this a long time ago. Yeah. So that's, um, and, and all these cases are the same. I mean, there's one on, if you go to homegrownerbalist.net, go to the blog and do a search for Miracle Max and it'll pull that up and I'll fix the pictures here tomorrow or what day is today, Friday. I'll probably fix the pictures Monday. Uh, but yeah, that was the case. There was nothing I could do surgically and I just used the poultice on him. I gave him some internal herbs too. Um, Juno, same thing. The one that had the, the little uh, Austra, uh, Alaskan Eskimo, same thing. Big wound, no way to close it. it was too big. So we just did the herbs. Uh, same thing. Well, all the cases we showed you on tonight, there was no way surgically to close it. There wasn't enough, no, wasn't enough skin there. So we used the poultice formula on them and it did great. Um, so yeah, go go to homegrownerbliss.net and look at the Juno case, look at the Reggie case and the uh, Morgan, the little dog with the foot. It tells you how I did all those things, okay? All right, and I'll put some cases like that on Herb Pet too, so you have them. Okay. Um, Lynn says, thanks for the doc for the information. Love your webinars. I'm glad. Okay. Um, okay, what to use for cat ear infections? Same as for dogs to clean them out. Um, calendula, make a calendula tea. That'll work. If it's a bacteria, if it's a really an ear infection, if it's mites, um, then you need to do some different things. Uh, we should have a webinar about that. Anyway, um, sometimes just some mineral oil or olive oil will suffocate the mites. Um, but there's also really good treatments that your vet can do that are very safe because it's all topical and it's not, it's, it's okay to do it. Um, some of the products you use for fleas and ticks will get mites too, ear mites. All right. All right. I have a healer that was diagnosed with thyroid cancer for two years. Are you too far away for treatment? Uh, do you send through the mail? We sell everything we sell. We send through the mail. Um, thyroid cancer, I mean, I'm in Idaho and I, and I sold my vet practice. Um, and you can probably find somebody local that can do it just as well because that's a surgical case. Okay. Um, not an herb case. I do use herbs on cancer dogs and it seems to help slow things down, improve quality of life. It's very, very, very rare, except with bladder cancers for some reason, but for most cancers, it's very, very, very rare that the herbs actually cure the cancer. Um, I've had like, I can count them on one hand in my, all my years. And I've, and I've addressed a lot of them that the cancer went away. 
Um, but there are herbs uh, that you can use to support the body and help it fight the cancer and do better. One is uh, the immune support formula. And if you go to Homegrown Herbalist, there's one called Blood Cleanse uh, that I use those two, immunity support and blood cleanse. Um, and it seems to help, it seems to make them feel better longer and do better longer, but it's probably not gonna make the tumor disappear. Okay. Um, John says, any suggestions for seizures in dogs and cats? I have treated some dogs and cats for seizures with herbs, and sometimes it's enough. Uh, I like passion flower and skull cap for that. Sometimes it's enough. Sometimes it's not enough, and you go to the meds, and that's okay. Um, in many, in most cases, in a lot of cases with seizures, the herbs work for a while, and then, and then you need to get on the meds too. So it just depends on the case. But passion flower and skullcap are worth a try, certainly. Okay. Um, Dr. Jones, so excited for the new modules about animals in the school. Yeah, that'll be fun. Tick bites on cats. Uh, well, if it's an infected bite, use that immunity and infection formula uh, internally, and you could put it on topically too. Um, what's it take to get you to come to a workshop? Well, I don't know. Have you got any donuts or anything? What are we? What What are you offering? <laughs> I do. Um, I do do road trips and workshops. It depends where you are. Um, but if you're anywhere in in the Inner Mountain West, uh, we we can probably work something out. Um, and of course, we do stuff here too. You know, in at our own facility here in Idaho. In fact. Uh, shameless plug, we are doing some workshops here sometime in April. I don't know when, uh, but if you go to homegrownerbalist.net and go to the events page, it'll tell you when and where and what we're doing. Um, May, 20th. May 20th, which is not in April. Evan hollered from the other room. It's May 20th. All right. I guess in April, I'm going down to a bunch of conferences in, in Utah, but anyway. Okay. Um, to speak and do stuff. Anyway, Annie, shoot me an email. We'll see what we can do for you. Any thoughts on pneumonia in pigs? I keep giving antibiotic, but it isn't helping much. Anything I can do with herbs? Yeah, you bet. Um, and that's a whole new topic, respiratory stuff. But we do have, um, if, if you go to homegrownherbalist.net, there's a kit there called the Respiratory Preparedness Kit. Look at that kit. And look at the formulas in that kit and you know it'll tell you there's a button on there that says how to use the formulas in this kit it'll tell you what to do um but you know there's a formula called shoe flu there's a formula called immunity support there's a lot of formulas with pigs you can just feed them the powder you know i wouldn't buy that little tincture kit for pigs i'd certainly buy one for for you for when you need it uh but for for pigs i'd buy the powder and dose them you know because they'll eat it um but that would probably help. Also, the big thing with pigs, and I used to do a lot of pig work. Uh, I used to live in Minnesota as a veterinarian, and I did a lot of consulting for pig farmers. And the biggest problem is ventilation and overcrowding. You know, so if you can get to the source of why they're getting stressed and sick and trouble in the first place, a lot of times it's ventilation and overcrowding that's causing pneumonia. And we're blaming the bugs. I mean, the bugs are in there too, and we gotta kill them once they're there, but prevention is a good thing. Okay, uh, Audrey says, how to help a teeny dog who's ancient and has no teeth and still eats, but is still skin and bones? Well, um, I would do a couple of things. I would put her on that, I assume it's a her, maybe it's a him. I'd put him on some of that nutritive formula, the nutritive and prebiotic, that'd be good. Um, I might put him on some fish oil to fatten him up a little bit. If he's really thin, uh, sometimes I'll put him on puppy food for a while because it's more calorically dense and vitamin rich than adult food. Uh, those are some ideas. Um, I have a goose with arthritis in her ankle from an injury that didn't get treated. She limps badly. Any herbs for geese? So I have to say, I've never treated arthritis in a goose. <laughs> Shoot, I thought I was doing so good tonight. <laughs> Um, arthritis in a goose. So first of all, 
um, you can give geese herbs, just like ducks and chickens, which I have done. Uh, and the arthritis formula, it would be very interesting to try that. I don't know why it wouldn't work, okay? Because they process herbs very much like we do and just like your dog does. Uh, try that and see if she's less gimpy. Um, but yeah, I don't, I can't say I've tried it, but it would be worth a try, certainly. And if it doesn't help her, give it to your husband. He'll walk better. Okay. Um, okay. Please talk about using poultice on humans. Do you have another product you recommend for human wounds? Uh, almost all of the formulas on herbpet.com I've tweaked and focused a little bit for pets. Okay. All of the products, except the poultice and the venom and sting, which are exactly the same because they're amazing for animals. Okay. I'm not changing them. <laughs> and so, yeah, the poultice formula, there's a, there's some cases on homegrownherbalistnet.net that are human cases. Go look at them. Uh, it uses it exactly the same way. Okay. Uh, so if you buy that formula in either place, it, it's the same thing. Okay. Most of the rest of them are a little different. Um, hopefully, Diane says, hopefully not your coon pigs. I don't know what a coon pig is. I don't know what that means. Um, ET phone home says, would neem oil work for fleas and ticks? Uh, it does have some activity against fleas and ticks. I wouldn't use it on a cat or a very small dog. And if you use it on a big dog, the amount of application, frequency of application, is going to be a big pain in the neck and it's not as effective and a big pain in the neck and everybody smells like neem oil i would just get the spot on from your vet unless you want the neem oil that you can do that too um i wouldn't use it on a really tiny dog or on a cat okay what kind of herbs can i use for my dog with kidney issues my dog's uh, kidneys are small and I've been giving them to Miss Thomas Sarton for it. Um, so there are some herbs that are very, very good for kidneys that are struggling. Um, my favorite one is probably nettle seed. That's the real rock star, but Romania is good. Chamomile is good. There are some herbs that are sort of, you know, really supportive of the kidneys. There's basically two kinds of herbs in the world. There's the ones that make you pee more and flush your kidneys out by stimulating the kidneys. And there's another group that restore and heal and really help the kidneys. Uh, there's a formula on homegrownerbless.net called Kidney Builder. All right, that's the one that I use for cases like that. And I've used it on dogs forever. So that would be good. Um, Okay. How do you get rid of ear mites and cats naturally? Um, again, sometimes some mineral oil or olive oil in there will help. Um, probably the, you know, naturally is going to be harder. Calendula might help. Uh, vinegar might help. And there's things you can do, but none of them are as effective as, as just using the medications. And the medications in a cat topically are really safe. You know, I, I just don't worry about them. Um, there's a lot of medicines that I hate and and really hate to use, and some that I won't use at all. Uh, ear cleaners and ear meds for mites and cats aren't one of those. Okay, that, I, I would just do that. Um, my hound stinks. My vet says some dogs just stink. <laughs> And he's right about that. Some dogs do stink. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I'll tell you, and, you know, it's hard to believe it, but it is true that sometimes improving the nutrition of the dog improves the smell of the dog. Okay. And, you know, if you do that nutritive and prebiotic formula and a little fish oil, sometimes that really helps. Uh, it gives them something they need and they're not as stinky. Uh, other than that, the other two solutions are shampoos and, and holding your nose. Uh, but yeah, and some dogs do just stink. 
Some dogs stink because their skin has a lot of folds in it and they get some anaerobic bacteria and things going and yeasts and stuff that stink, but some dogs just stink. Um, what's a good natural cat food diet? I can only really get my cat to eat chicken. Any other recommends recommendations for foods or herbs I could try? Um, you know, I don't have, uh, you know, there are things available at the big box stores, raw food diets, and you might try that. Um, I don't have a, a preference. Most of the, uh, the canned cat foods aren't nearly as bad as the dog foods that, you know, the cat foods don't have nearly the ingredient problems that, that the dog foods have. Um, but the other thing you can do is, you know, go to one of the big pet stores that has a lot of variety and see what they have for a raw food diet or an all natural cat food. And they probably have things. Okay. Brenda Reardon. Have you observed that non-herbal flea drops cause cancer in dogs and cats? I have not. Almost nothing causes cancer in cats. I can count on these fingers how many cat cases of cancer I've seen in the last 30 years. It's, it's really hard to give cats cancer. Um, and in fact, the only cancers I've ever seen in cats are two things. One, Sometimes you'll see some squamous cell carcinomas in the mouth of a cat, super rare. And sometimes you'll see, and you don't anymore because they fixed it, but years ago, uh, some of the vaccines, the adjuvant for some of the vaccines they gave cats caused cancer in cats and they'd get a, a tumor, local skin tumor. Um, but it's pretty rare. Uh, I haven't heard of anything I've been a vet for 30 years and we've used a lot of topical flea and tick products in dogs and cats. I've never seen a case of cancer in my practice that I thought related remotely to that. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't, I, you know, I'm nothing is perfectly safe and everything needs a cost benefit analysis, but uh, I don't find those products to be particularly alarming to me in my experience. Okay. Um, my dog has a black dry spot on the inner ear. Would you, what could that be and how to treat it? A black dry spot on the inner ear. I don't know. Have your vet look at it and tell me what it is. And then we can talk about that. A black dry spot. It might not be anything. It might just be a pigment spot. It might, it could be a lot of things. Any suggestions for an ear hematoma without surgery? Um, no, that needs to be drained. That needs to be drained. Sometimes if you get them early, you don't need to do surgery. Sometimes, uh, sometimes I can just drain it with a needle and wrap it. And, you know, I mean, a hypodermic needle um, as a veterinarian. Uh, but if it's seriously full, it needs to be drained or he'll have a big, ugly scar, wacky ear the rest of his life. Okay. And have your vet do that. Okay. Um, what's a good worm medication for dogs that isn't too toxic? Okay. Well, so we had the herb formula. You talked about that, but there's also a medication called Pyrantel. Uh, one of the brands of that is Strongid, which is a fabulous warmer and really, really, really safe because mammals can't even absorb it. Okay. Uh, I've used, that's the warmer I use in the practice. Uh, super safe, super safe. I wouldn't hesitate on that one at all. Okay. Um, what's a good heartworm medication for dogs? is isn't too tired. Oh, oh. Oh, I'm reading the same question type twice, but this time I'm using all the words. A good heartworm medication that isn't too toxic. All the heartworm medications are basically the same thing. Uh, and again, I, I don't live in a heartworm endemic area, but I do have dogs in the practice that are on heartworm meds and I haven't ever seen any issues. Um, let me make sure that's true. Trying to remember if I've ever had dogs that had, that didn't, you know, they got belly aches and didn't like it. It seems like I may have had one or two of those in 30 years that they didn't like the medicine that made them, you know, nauseous and not want to eat. 
Um, but I'm trying real hard to remember if there was one of the two or one or two of those in 30 years. You know what I mean? So th those medications are, you know, they're they're I think quite safe. Um, I think they're absolutely vastly safer than having heartworms. Okay, again, it's that risk benefit analysis. Okay, um, our lab has diarrhea all of a sudden, and we don't know what he might have gotten into. How long do we wait before calling our vet? Or is there something we can do ourselves? Well, so depends on the dog, right? If it's a lab puppy and he has really bad diarrhea and he's vomiting, he might have parvo and you better get him to the vet, right? If he's a regular lab that's had his shots and is a regular guy, uh, he probably ate something dumb and has a little enteritis, okay? Uh, and certainly in my experience, even as a vet, I just give those dogs some of that digestive support formula. That's what I do. And nine times out of 10, that straightens them out. If it doesn't, sometimes they need some medications. If the diarrhea is chronic and long lasting, sometimes it's something else. You know, sometimes it can be a symptom of something more serious. So if you can't fix it up, then get him to the vet, you know, but if he's not vomiting and he's not a puppy, uh, I will, if you brought him to me, I'd give him the digestive support formula from herpet.com. That's what I would do. Uh, so, all right. Um, thank you, Kelly says, your, for your times and answers. Your webinars are so informative. I love being part of the school. Also, I'm very glad. Is there anything that can be done to help with cat leukemia? Okay, and cat leukemia is another cancer that you sometimes see, uh, but it's actually almost always caused by a virus. Okay. I think we'll someday be surprised how many other cancers are caused by a virus, but that's another topic too. Um, so the immunity support would be a good idea because those cats tend to be a little bit immune compromised. Um, feline leukemia is a retrovirus like HIV is a retrovirus. They're, they're related. So it has some immune suppressive problems. Um, that immunity support formula, if you took one day a week off, and gave it to her, that'd be okay. Um, or certainly if she ever came down with the beginnings of anything, that would be okay. Um, other than supporting the immune system, I don't know of anything, you know, you could, I don't know that you could get the, I don't know if you could get the, I don't have a lot of experience giving blood cleanse to cats because they don't get cancer very much. Uh, but the immunity support and the blood cleanse together is what I do for cancer cases to support them. Um, anything long-term I'm doing, by the way, for a human or an animal, I'm going to take off one day a week or every week or two, I'm going to take a day off from the herbs. Okay. Um, if it's a long-term maintenance thing. All right. Um, thank you for sharing your knowledge. Please let us know what you think is the best option for prevention of ticks and fleas. Um, probably a good quality spot on from your veterinarian, not from the feed store. Some of the feed store ones are very toxic. And I've had some dogs in big trouble come in that had been treated with those. I've never had any issues with the other ones and they're really the only thing that works great. So there are some herbal things that work kind of, you know, we talked about diatomaceous earth and neem oil and some of these other things. Uh, Dawn soap, that's great for fleas, but it, but it won't prevent ticks. And if the tick bites him, he's, he might get sick from limes or heartworm or, or I mean, uh, Rocky Mountain Spotted Peter. So, I think the spot on products, if you're in a high tick area, especially, I, I think that's the way to go. And again, I'm an herb nut, would rather do something herbal first every time, but but I gotta give the nod to the pharmaceutical spot ons for fleas and ticks. Unless it's just fleas and you don't mind giving them a bath with Don soap once a week. That's okay, that works. Okay, uh, Emily says, this is great info. How do allergies manifest in cats? My cat seems to sneeze a lot seasonally. Okay, sneezing in cats is usually not an allergy, but sometimes it is. Uh, probably it's more mechanical sneezing, like it's dusty and windy in the summer, so I sneeze more. Um, most of the time with cats that are sneezing a lot, it's a sinus infection, uh, which is a whole different problem. And sometimes a very hard problem to solve in cats. Um, but, Usually cats with allergies have skin trouble, just like dogs. They're usually itchy and red and, you know, have dermatitis. That's what they usually do with allergies. 
Okay. So I think. Nope, it's not. Let's see. Oh, okay. And then uh, Misha asks about uh, the leukemia too when you talked about that. Can we use SEAC T with our Labrador as a detox or preventative? Um, SEAC T is safe for your Labrador. Um, for detoxing and preventative, I mean, it would do those things. You know, it's got liver and kidney tonics in it. Um, so yeah, I mean, from a safety standpoint, yeah, that would work. Um, I don't usually do cleanses on dogs and cats. Uh, I don't know why I don't do, but usually what I do is I just do the nutritive and prebiotic and I think that's enough. You know, that's enough fiber, enough stuff to clean them out. Um, but yeah, Essiac has not got things in it that are dangerous for your dog. Okay, uh, are there herbs that can be used to help with bad breath and teeth cleaning in a Yorkie mix? Um, well, there are a lot of things that I've done with dogs over the years. There's a there's a formula on herbpet.com called Teeth and Gum Care that will decrease bacteria loads. It's very good for gingivitis. It's very good for periodontal issues. Um, if your dog has really bad teeth, flip his lip and look. But if he has really bad teeth and really bad periodontal disease, get him to the vet, get him knocked out, and get his teeth cleaned because you'll never get that stuff off. And don't let the groomer tell you she can get it off because she can't, okay? It's, 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 it's beyond a groomer. And I love groomers. I'm not beating up on groomers. I think groomers can do a lot of great things. Um, but a real deep teeth cleaning on a dog with serious periodontal disease, no, you gotta go to the vet. Get them cleaned and once they're cleaned, do that teeth and gum care from herbpet.com. Um, and if they're not terrible, or if it's just a bad breath thing, you can do that too. You just mix that powder with the toothpaste and brush his gums and teeth with it, if he'll let you do that. Uh, and it, it'll decrease bacterial loads is why they get halitosis or bad breath is because they got, you know, bugs growing in their mouth. All right. Um, what can be given to help a canine with cognitive disorder? Well, that's a great question. Um, there are some herbs that can help to some degree with cognitive function. And we did a big webinar on that. It was probably for this, might have been for the students. It might have been on YouTube. I can't ever remember who I do on YouTube and who's in the school. Join the school and then you'll know. <laughs> you'll get both of them. <laughs> anyway, um, herbs like sage can help with memory. The ginsengs can help with memory. Ginkgo is great because it improves circulation of the brain. Ashwagandha can help. There's a formula on homegrownerbalist.net. I don't have it on herbpet.com, but on homegrownerbalist.net, there's a formula called memory and alertness that can be helpful. I've used that on dogs. Um, I've also used that on dogs that have had strokes and had some really amazing results. That's a whole nother webinar too. But anyway, web, memory and alert, alertness is that formula. It's on homegrownerbalist.net. Okay, John says, thanks, Doc. Always informative and helpful. I'm glad you enjoyed it, John. Let's see, I think we might be out of... Nope, not quite. Why do you keep asking questions? All right. <laughs> Tina says, I'm concerned about the new avian flu in my chickens. Any recommendation on how to keep them healthy and safe? Yeah, you bet. Um, influenza viruses, there's a lot of herbs that can help with influenza viruses. Um, what I do is I use uh, in the same herbs I use on humans. One is called, and they're on homegrownerbalist.net uh, for respiratory influenzas. Um, what, and we'll probably put some respiratory herbs on herb pet as soon as I get 10 minutes. Anyway, one's called shoe flu and one's called immunity support. Those are the ones I would use on chickens. And just put the powder in with their grain. They'll eat it up. They don't care. Um, but if you go to the 
if you go to homegrown herbalist and look at the formulas, there's a section on respiratory stuff and look at those formulas and you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, how do you treat hot spots? That's a good question too. We should have a YouTube video on that. So a hot spot is a dermatitis. It's a moist dermatitis. So what happens is usually what happens is the hair gets wet, it gets matted down. It's a hot muggy day and the water from the wet hair makes everything hot and wet and warm and the yeast go nuts and you get a hot spot. Okay. So what do you do with that? Well, I would use that uh, infection and immunity formula as a spray on the hot spot. If it's a, and they're kind of raw, so I'm going to mix that with some water just like I would the poultice. Okay. Um, but just keeping it clean and spraying it with that formula will kill the bugs. Clip the hair off, right? But that's what I would do with it. All right. Um, on wounds, do you just put the poultice on the open wound or do you use the herbs fresh or dried? Uh, yeah, I just put them on the open wound. I used to, nowadays, I just use the spray. I take the tincture, I put a teaspoon of the tincture in two to four ounces of water and I spray it frequently and it heals right up. I don't do anything with herb powders anymore for pulses, hardly ever. Occasionally, rarely, there's specific cases where I do that if I want to pull something out of the wound mechanically. But everything else is just getting the spray nowadays. Uh, but you can just take the herbs fresh or dried powder, mix it with a little water if it's a dry powder, and slap them on topically. I slap them right on the wound. You know, go to the go to homegrownerbalist.net and look at the blog. There's one on a head wound on a lady that had a big uh, tumor removed off her scalp, and we healed that up with herbs, just slapping the weeds on uh, the powdered herbs with water. And Max Miracle Max is another case where we did it that way. But I don't do it that way anymore because I've had worse wounds where I just did the spray and it worked just as well. So, I, you know, but yeah, either way is fine. Um, Misha, the cat mutation of coronavirus into FIP, which is feline infectious paranoia, treatment and post-treatment if used, uh, GS44 or 1524 to treat. So coronaviruses in cats, so like I said, every species has a coronavirus. Sometimes they jump species. Uh, I've read and I believe uh, that the coronavirus that we currently have is a bat coronavirus that was studied in labs for years and years. Um, so we didn't get that from the bats. I think we got it from uh, poor lab hygiene or something more sinister. I don't know. You figure that out yourself. But anyway, the Sometimes I'll jump species, but the cat coronavirus is a specific cat coronavirus. And if you took poop from a million cats and checked them all, most of them would have coronavirus in it and they wouldn't care. It wouldn't be causing any trouble. Sometimes it mutates into this feline infectious peritonitis and it's a disaster and very, very deadly and they don't survive from it. Um, I have not had success treating that with herbs. Um, because usually by the time I get them in the vet clinic, they're almost done. You know, that's, it's a sudden onset thing sometimes and they're almost dead. I mean, you know, I mean, they're really in bad shape. Um, so I don't, you know, I mean, I would use immunity support uh, and I would use the respiratory antiviral formulas from homegrownnervos.net because it's a Corona and Elder and Mullen and Yarrow and guys like that like to kill Coronas. Um, but because of the advanced state and the deep tissue problem, of that particular variant of that particular disease, uh, by the time I see them and I'm in a position to do anything for them, they're, they're usually almost dead. And I haven't had any luck pulling them around with that. So I haven't had any luck pulling them around with anything. That's, that's a horrible disease. Okay. Um, we, for fleas called... Okay, so John's used a formula called Kiristan or an oil. I don't know. I don't know what that is. Um, oh, oh, okay. So John's saying that he used a, a topical essential oil called Kiristan and that, if I'm understanding him right, he said that his cat was sneezing a lot and when he stopped using the oil, the cat quit sh sh sneezing. Okay, uh, and that's 
very true. Um, oh, okay, he clarifies here on the next slide. Anyway, yeah, um, essential oils, many essential oils in cats are a really bad idea. And we've, we've covered that. But yeah, thanks for sharing that, John. Okay. Um, okay. Poor cat, but clean says hello. Hello. Um, Michael says, can my cat take burdock tea? Absolutely. You bet she can. Or you can just throw a little burdock powder in her cat food. She'll probably eat it. It tastes good. Uh, how to prevent avian flu in chickens. We've talked about that. I would use the immunity support and the, uh, on the homegrown herbalist side, immunity support and uh, shoe flu. S H O O F L O O. That's how you spell shoe flu. Um, okay. What is safe for vomiting and diarrhea in a small dog? Okay. So the question is what's causing the vomiting and diarrhea? Right? And that's why. Sometimes you need to get the diagnosis so that we can solve the problem. Uh, vomiting and diarrhea could be pancreatitis, which is serious. It could be food poisoning. Um, it could be a foreign body. It could be, you know, a lot of other things. Some of them are scarier than those things. So it's really important to, to find out what's the cause. If you have a dog that's vomiting for more than, more than a day, you better get him in and see what's going on. Sometimes they're just vomiting because they ate something dumb and they do it two or three times and they're done. If they're not vomiting the next day, don't worry about it. You know what I mean? But kidney failure can cause vomiting and diarrhea in a dog. You know, so we, we kind of have to have a diagnosis and I can't really say, oh, well, you need this or that um, for that kind of a scenario. Uh, and the other problem is that sometimes it's very difficult to keep herbs in, in a vomiting dog, right? And so sometimes you have to go in and get the IV and get the vet. You know, sometimes they're the best solution. Okay. Uh, Mainac says, I read that ledlum, led, Latum Pulse Mother Tincture made from a plant for making homeopathic remedies can repel fleas. I've been looking for the plant, but I've been unable to find it or a mother tincture of it. I have no idea. I have no idea. I don't know anything about homeopathy. Uh, so I don't know. There are a lot of things that people say work on the internet and it has been my experience that that's often not the case with flea prevention stuff, but I'd love to be wrong. If you find out something really cool, let me know. Um, uh, what would you give a horse if they have EHV? Um, that's a herpes virus infection. Um, you're not going to cure it, but you can suppress herpes by stimulating immunity. There are some herbs that have specific action against terpies like, uh, you know, calendula, lemon balm. There's some herbs that kill, that beat up herpes pretty bad. Um, but it gets buried in the nerve roots and you'll never cure it. I don't think, um, there's a, there's a company called silver lining herbs. That's dear friends of mine. They sell herbs in big horsey sized bags. Um, so that's probably what I would do is call those guys and they'll send you some stuff. Uh, Gia says, I love your show. Thanks. Um, thanks for watching. Um, okay. So now Manex is saying, let them plus 30 C homeopathic remedy will help with ticks and other insect bites as, uh, as well as puncture wounds. And again, I don't know. I don't have any opinion on homeopathics cause I don't know anything about it. I have some opinions about it, but. And they're not, I mean, some of them are good opinions. Sometimes they really work, but I don't, I don't use them. I know people that use them, veterinarians, straight laced guys that are science based and sometimes they work. Some of them work very well. Uh, so I'm not beating them up, but I don't know diddly about them. So can't help you on that one, but thanks for sharing. Half Acre Homestead, you're so generous with your time and knowledge, Dr. Jones. Thanks so much. I'm saving up to join the school. I can't wait. We can't wait to have you. Holler when you're ready. We'd love to be on that journey with you. It's fun. Learning about herbs is fun. Your instructions with the poultice formula were excellent. We avoided the puncture wounds on my daughter's boxer, used mainly on areas of mix, missing skin. Oh, good. I'm glad, Diane. Thanks for the webinar and the great information. Okay. Ledlam. Brandy says ledlam is rosemary. 
and that it's and that that homeopathic is great for puncture wounds and lockjaw. All right, that's fun. One of these days, I need to learn more homeopathy. Which, but I have so many things I'm trying to do right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, poor but clean says I made a broth with bouillon, parsley, sage, oregano, basil, and he seems to be keeping that down. He's a little better, but it did freak me out. I have also been giving him ACV in his water. I assume that's apple cider vinegar. Um, you know, is it was this the vomiting dog? Yeah, okay, I see that. So that was the vomiting dog. You know, I mean, ginger can help vomiting, peppermint and catnip and things like that can help vomiting if it's a mild case that's not something scary and bad, right? And and the er parsley and sage and oregano and basil, those are all mints except the parsley. And all the mints are good for calming the stomach and the guts. So you did good, those are good choices. Um, and if that helped, good, that's good. If you can keep it down, that then, then that means that's probably all he needs and that's good. If it continues, if the vomiting continues, dehydration gets a problem. And if the vomiting really continues, it might be because it's something really serious. And so, you know, just be aware of that. And if, if it gets to be a problem, uh, that's, you know, get a vet to find out what the problem is. All right, Michael Jones, that's a great last name, says thanks. And thanks to you, Michael, for watching. Okay, so um, that's all the questions. I am very grateful for your time and patience. This was a longer video than some of you probably had buckled up for. Uh, <laughs> but we appreciate it. We appreciate your support. We appreciate your enthusiasm to learn things. And we love learning stuff with you. So that's great. Um, please swing by homegrownherbalist.net. There's a lot of resources there. Um, there's a lot of other YouTube videos on our YouTube channel here too. Uh, we have a whole line of herb formulas for humans on homegrownherbalist.net. And we have this brand new website, herbpet.com. We would love your support over there. Uh, swing by and have a look. And uh, if there's things that you need or want that aren't there, holler and we'll see if we can uh, get that done. Um, so I'm Dr. Patrick Jones. There's getting to be some more questions here. I'm just going to do them. All right. Uh, so mastitis in a cow, there's two kinds of mastitis. One is uh, gram positive mastitis is like staphs and streps. Um, if it's staph aureus, that gets deep in the tissue. It's very hard to eradicate or clean that up. Certainly immune stimulating herbs can help. Um, we need to do it. That's a deep subject. And I was a dairy vet for a long time. And I can tell you a lot of things about mastitis, but that's a deeper topic. I'll do... Uh, I'll do something on that, okay? Um, any help for bladder leaking in an 11-year-old dog? Uh, okay, so we talked about in that in the webinar. That's the old dogs with the leaky bladders. Go back and, and watch that bit. Um, and the little pukey dog's mom said he ate something funny. Yeah, so he ate something weird and got a bellyache, and that's why he was throwing up. That's a good reason to throw up. What can you do for a cat, Rachel says, who seems to be suffering from separation anxiety since her brother disappeared? That's a good question, and that's a real thing. Pets get very attached to their housemates, and when their brother, or sister, kitty, or dog dies, they mourn, and they worry, and they fret, and they walk around looking for them, and it's a problem. Uh, one solution for that is to get her another friend, you know, get her another kitty or a puppy or whatever it was she lost. Um, I have used, we have a formula called Calm on HerbPet.com that can help them through the short term sometimes. I use that on dogs with separation anxiety or cats. I use it if you can get a cat to take it. Sometimes they won't on that one. Um, separation anxiety, uh, fear aggression, dogs who freak out on the 4th of July because of the fireworks, uh, dogs that are going through an anxiety because of a death in the family or something. I've used that formula on all of those things and with very good results. Um, so have a look at that formula on herbpet.com. Calm. We didn't talk about that tonight, but look at, look at that one. Okay. Um, 
I have a German shepherd who's disappeared for four days and then finally turned up at the pound. When I picked her up, she had meds for blood in her stool and hasn't eaten for three weeks. Okay. Uh, so first of all, I'd get a diagnosis on that. And if he can't find anything scary and bad, I'd put her on, and even if he does find something scary and bad and does other things, I'd put her on that nutritive and prebiotic. And I'd put her on a probiotic too. Okay. So she needs the bugs and she needs the stuff to feed the bugs, which is the prebiotic. Um, and that also the digestive formula to heal up whatever's going on with that gut. Um, and nine times out of 10, that'll work it out. If it doesn't work it out, get a diagnosis and see what's going on. But that's what I'd do with her. I'd do the nutritive and prebiotic and I would do a probiotic, which we'll have that on the website soon. I just don't have it in yet. Um, and the digestive support formula. Okay. Pam says she's slowly dying. The dog, yeah, yeah, that's what I would do with her. Um, and if and if she's a really old dog, she might be slowly dying of something, and you know, or, or she may have something else going on. Get a diagnosis if she's in really bad shape, and see what's going on. Um, but I would put her on the digestive support and the prebiotic and a probiotic as a bare minimum. Okay. Poor but clean says, you're amazing. I love this channel. Incoming binging marathon. <laughs> oh, well, I'm glad you like the videos. <laughs> Take a snack. We don't want you to binge too long if you don't have any snacks. That's no fun. All right. Neola says she's in the school. Thanks, Doc. You're the best. I've learned a lot in the school. We got the virus and one thing after another. So I'm behind. I love seeing you look so well. Love you. Thanks, Neela. We love you too. We're glad to have you. She's a sweetheart. Um, <laughs> right. Poor, poor McLean says that the little kitty reacts anytime somebody mentions her brother's name. Yeah, they're not dumb. It's, it's amazing how attached they get. I'll tell you a funny story about animals knowing each other's names. I had goats. I've had goats off and on a lot in my life. But we had these four goats and they were sweet and super great goats. And we were, uh, we had the four of them and, and we went out to the pen and three of them ran up to the pen, right? And one of them didn't, we didn't see her. <clears throat> and my wife says, and I can't even remember what the goat's name was, but she says, you know, where's Sally? And all the goats looked over to the, around the corner of the shed where Sally was and we couldn't see her and Sally comes out walking around. I mean, it's like they knew her name. It's crazy. I think I think a lot of these critters are smarter than we give them credit for. Anyway, <laughs> I'm sorry the kitty said that's no fun. Um, uh, poor McLean says my dog also had blood in his stool. We've been giving him Greek yogurt and oats and honey and licorice root powder. Yeah, there you go. That works too. Uh, baby food, a meat-based baby food, just to get some nutrition in her. You know, I don't know if it was a her or him. But yeah, I would do the nutritive, I would do the probiotic, and I would do some digestive support too. That would help a lot. Okay, so if you have other questions, just put them in the comments below. We're going to wrap this up so people can go home and get a snack. Uh, but we really appreciate you tuning in and hanging around and asking questions and sharing things and teaching us stuff. I always learn something fun when I talk to somebody about herbs, so that's good. Swing by the website, homegrownherbalist.net and herbpet.com. We'd love to have your support. Go buy something and that'll make us both feel happy inside. And if you go to herbpet.com, it'll make your dog feel happy inside. That's a three win, right? So <laughs> anyway, Doc Jones here from the Homegrown Herbalist School of Botanical Medicine. Have a great night. Thanks for listening and have a good day. Unless it's night or day. You, you figure that part out yourself. Anyway, I'm going to go home and go to bed. Thanks for watching.